Good evening, everybody. Welcome back to Exploring the Lord of the Rings. My name is Corey Olson, the Tolkien Professor, and I am delighted to be joining you back for session number 86 of Exploring the Lord of the Rings. Session number 86, and who knows? Maybe we'll leave the Trollglade tonight. It could totally happen. Since we pretty much finished the poem almost last time, I think we stand a real chance of... Uh, um, of, uh, of making that happen. So, um, I wanted to, uh, uh, okay, well, I was going to say jump straight in, but actually, no, that's a lie. I, I wanted to make two announcements first. One, just a quick reminder, as I announced last week, uh, just a reminder of our holiday special on Anytime Audits at Signum University. So if you wanted to uh, give a friend or, uh, or, or relative um, uh, it, access to one of our awesome courses uh, for uh, for the holidays this year. Really uh, unusual, different kind of gift. Um, we're having a special on that. $75 is the total tuition for access to any one of our courses of their choice uh, from our catalog. So you just uh, get a gift certificate and they can pick whatever course they want. They want to learn Old Norse. They want to uh, study Tolkien's non uh, Middle Earth works. They want to look at uh, what my Lewis and Tolkien class, or I mean, there's so many things. Um, uh, so, or like a Harry Potter class, the Star Wars class, a science fiction survey, Lovecraft class, so many awesome options. So anyway, um, I, uh, I, 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 uh, I just recommend that to you. You can find the link on the homepage there, uh, Signum University. Uh, .org. And Stephanie, it is true, you can buy them for yourself as well. It's also just kind of doubles as a sale on everything, essentially. Uh, so you can totally buy them for yourself. Um, anyway, so cool. Uh, the other thing that I wanted to make sure to mention is in two days, on Thursday evening this week, is the last Mythgard Movie Club of 2018, as they're going to be talking about The Crimes of Grindelwald, the new Fantastic Beasts film, and you can talk about what on earth fantastic beasts uh have to do with uh grindelwald so anyway uh that uh, uh that's gonna be a really fun panel it's gonna be actually i, I think uh, most of the same people who were in the very first uh movie panel that we ever did the one on uh, the first fantastic uh beasts film uh and rogue one uh so they're kind of coming back together and they're going to be talking about the follow-up film here this year uh so that should be uh that should be a lot of fun again that's thursday evening um and again, you can find the link to that. Go to signumuniversity.org and scroll down a little bit, and you'll find that uh, you'll find that there. So, um, okay, cool. Anyway, so that's um, uh, that's the. Uh, um, that's the news from. T ah, I see Fourth Dauntless just mentioning that he he uh, got the Canterbury Tales class uh, during the campaign. Yeah, that's that, that class was so much fun. Oh my goodness, I loved that Chaucer class. I've never, you know, despite studying and teaching Chaucer for years, I had never ever gotten the chance to just go through and do like all of Chaucer, you know, in two semesters, um, you know, a two semester Chaucer class in which the first semester we did all of the, you know, poems that we almost never get to do in Chaucer, all of his minor poems. And, uh, that is all of his, his shorter stuff, the dream vision poems, uh, and Troilus and Crusade. I'd never taught Troilus and Crusade before. So much fun. Uh, and then, um, and then it was, uh, and then of course the second semester is the Canterbury Tales class, which was uh, which was great fun. Canterbury Tales, of course, I have taught before, uh, but uh, I did get to do some fun things that I didn't usually uh, get to do uh, because in my other Chaucer classes I was trying to squeeze some non-Canterbury Tales stuff in there also. So since I got a whole semester for that, I got to uh, do more Canterbury Tales than I'd ever done before. So anyway, really really uh, uh, fun uh, uh, fun classes. So. Okay, um, so let's um, let us jump in uh, to the text here. To, okay, okay, no, see, I'm trying to jump in again, and still no. There's no there, there. There shall be no jumping because before jumping, we had a bunch of really awesome comments here uh, uh, in the discussion board, comments and questions, uh, which I wanted to talk about. So. We're braving the road, which has a kind of double entendre here this evening. Of course, we're uh, talking about. Strider and the hobbits uh, bravely returning to the road, which you'll remember they were terrified even to cross, uh, as we discussed uh, several weeks back. But uh, it also, this is uh, us uh, bravely setting out to perhaps leave the Trollglade and head towards the road here tonight in our discussion. So we'll uh, 
we'll see. We'll see uh, where we get to there. But first, a few comments. Three, though I don't think they'll take that long. This one uh, is short, but I wanted to, I wanted to uh, mention it. I for detail uh, clarified something, which I have to admit I was not picturing. Um, so the, uh, the, the, the passage in question is when they woke up up on the, 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 the pass up in the hills, the one that Frodo almost collapsed getting up to the night before, the beginning of this very good and warm and cheerful day so far that they've been enjoying that we've been discussing for the last few weeks. The morning dawned bright and fair, the air was clean, and the, pale, and the light pale and clear in a rain-washed sky. Their hearts were encouraged, but they longed for the sun to warm their cold, stiff limbs. Um, okay, so... I, uh, uh, in my, uh, in, in our discussion of that passage, um, I for detail recalls that I passed that by as meaning the sun was hidden by the clouds because of course they're longing for the sun, right? Uh, to warm their stiff limbs. Uh, but the rest of the language, bright and fair, pale and clear, does not lend itself to a cloudy day. Totally agree with him. This is actually a common experience for anyone who has spent time camping, especially in slightly more northern climes. Oxford is about the same latitude as Calgary, Alberta, which I believe is the area around which Eifer Detail is from. Uh, you are often up well before the sun is in the sky. Indeed, the sky begins to lighten about an hour before Arian appears. And considering they are in a mountain pass, it's easy to imagine that the sun could have already risen perhaps hours ago, but is still hidden behind a mountain. I've gone hiking in the mountains in October and not seen the sun until afternoon. Uh, as in the autumn, the sun does not rise as high in the sky. Uh, this is uh, uh, great. I think that this is um, a, you know a really... Uh, good way of thinking about this. I did not consider this possibility, but of course he's entirely correct. Uh, it may well be that they are still longing for the sun to warm their cold, stiff limbs, not because the sun is concealed in the sky, but because they're in the shadow of the mountains still. Uh, if they are in this sort of saddle, uh, uh, as it's described, uh, uh, between uh, between two peaks, the sun might be behind one of those peaks. They're looking out south, right? So actually that seems almost prohibitively likely, in fact. So I no doubt they would be uh, 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 wishing for the sun, longing for the sun, that is, uh, even if the sun, in fact, was already up in the sky. So uh, great. And just a little side note, I love the fact that, you know, in this <laughs> in this discussion of the Lord of the Rings, we have people being like, hang on a second, you blew past that two sentence description of the atmospheric conditions on this morning way too quickly. Right. I think we seriously overlooked some possibilities there. Um, fantastic. I, I totally uh, I totally uh, I love that. So thanks I for detail. You're almost certainly correct. I totally agree with you. Completely convinced. OK, second. Uh, the first of our two comments on words from the poem, uh, which we discussed last time, the troll poem. Uh, this is from Beach27, who says, I thought I'd point to one more possible bit of irony or wordplay that Tolkien employed regarding the line, and his bootless foot is lasting lame. We know Tom has hurt himself permanently, but it's not immediately obvious why he should be bootless too. However, I think the use, and I remember we talked about bootless as a play on words there. Uh, however, I think the use of lasting essentially tells us. A shoe last is the 3D model around which one makes a shoe. Shoe lasting, then, is the final fit of the upper and lower aspects minus the outsole around said model. Lasts are of various sizes and purposes. A dress shoe is built on a narrower last than a hiking boot, for example. But generally, they are pretty standardized, and they certainly were in the pre-industrial world. So I think it's clear that, one, Tom's foot is too broken to be accommodated by any normal fitting boot. Two, Tom, despite talking down to the troll, seemingly regarding class and not just his trollishness, isn't wealthy enough to afford a bespoke boot. By the way, I think I spent like a minute just giggling over the phrase bespoke boot. I don't know what it is about that phrase that I just thought was delightful, but I just, I, that's like my phrase of the day, bespoke boot. Anyway, okay. And I think it may be that, one, Tolkien is playing with last lasting as it pertains to both the endurance of Tom's injury and the irony that his last no longer fits a boot. And two, you might even say that Tom's foot is a model or last of, lame, of lameness. Uh, 
this is really cool. I, I, I had no idea of that, uh, uh, that definition of last uh, and of lasting, therefore. Um, of course, with things like this, you can never be sure, right? I mean, of course, it's easy to, to say, and, 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 and of course, very truly said, uh, that Tolkien's familiarity with words and etymologies and, and you know, with, with, with the language in general always makes it at least possible, if not actually probable, that, you know, he was, you know, very well aware of obscure meanings like this and, 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 and may very well have been playing on them. Even Tolkien, of course, doesn't know everything, right? And uh, uh, and doesn't necessarily think of everything, uh, every possible implication of every word that he uses, despite the fact that he loves words and knows so much about them. Nevertheless, um, you know, so you can't ever be sure that he actually intended that that this this kind of wordplay. However. I still think it's kind of awesome <laughs> and whether or not Tolkien actually intended this, uh, I think it's really cool. I think he would have enjoyed it. Uh, I, if, uh, uh, whether he meant it or not, I, th I think that he would like it. So I like it certainly. Um, and I think that that's pretty cool, uh, especially since, of course, his bootless foot is lasting lame. As I mentioned before, has always been one of my favorite lines of that song. Uh, so the idea of this sort of additional wordplay uh, in that line is uh, is pretty cool. Right. I mean, I, I think that's uh, uh, that's pretty nice. So Fourth Dauntless is asking, was Tolkien a punny fellow? I've never noticed that in other parts of his writing. He doesn't delight in puns in the way that some uh, incorrigible authors do, such as Shakespeare, for instance, uh, who never lets the opportunity for a pun pass him by. Um, I, so, I mean, he doesn't, but that's more about like what his sense of humor is like, right? Um, he's, he doesn't reach for puns in order to make jokes usually. Um, however, um, I, does he like to play on multiple meanings of words? Yeah, yeah. No, that is a thing that we see him doing. It's not exa it's not the same thing really as as punning. Uh but um uh but yeah, I mean I, what might m what would you say is the the difference between what I'm calling playing on the meaning of words and uh enjoying puns? I'm not sure I can define it exactly. I mean, the 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 uh, Bruce, I agree. The multiple use, the multiple implications of bootless is, of course, uh, a a pun or a play on word. Um, uh, it is kind of a. I mean, you could call it a pun if you want to call it a pun. Um, I love puns. I have no objection to them. Um, but um, I, I th the thing that I think I'm trying to put my finger on is. There are, it's like a means versus ends question, right? In those occasions when the, the play on words, when the pun, right? Like it is the punchline, like by itself. Um, I, that's what I'm characterizing as like somebody who, who has a real delight in puns, who just goes way out of his way. To make puns, right? Because they are delightful in themselves. Whereas somebody who will you who will play on the double meanings of words, the you know the potential double meanings of words or triple meanings of words, as you know, sort of part of another overall thing. But it's again, it's not the end point, right? It's not the punchline. Um, that's that's sort of the distinction I'm trying to make. In the end, it's not a very useful or powerful kind of distinction, um, but. Um, uh, but to me, that's, that's why, uh, so if somebody, you know, fourth thoughtless back to what you were originally saying that you never really noticed that Tolkien was a big punner, right? Um, no, not in that first sense, right? I mean, he's not somebody who just kind of will deliver an entire line just to set up a pun, right? Just to set up a play on words. Uh, he doesn't work like that, but will he use a play on words in order to set up another idea? Oh Yeah. A lot actually, um, uh, he you know delighted in um, in all of those kinds of uh, uh, you know the sort of interplay of 
of meanings and playing, making jokes. Again, it's not, it's not even like, oh no, like uh, one form is serious and intellectual and the other is like base humor, right? No, no, like Tolkien makes jokes, right? He makes philological jokes about words. Um, anyway, so yeah, yeah, it's, um, well, see, actually, oh, wait, that's a really good example. Um, Atalanta, right? It is a play on words. Um, a play on words of, of well, that, that, that's kind of different. Like the play on words with the name Atlantis, just as Avalone, right? You know, as he's, uh, you know, referring to or sort of playing on the name of Avalon. Um, but that I would actually say is different. That's sort of part of the whole mythic structure of, uh, of what he's doing in those stories, which I think really kind of puts it into a, uh, into a different sort of context. But, um, but anyway, again, the, the, the point, uh, to me is not, um, is, is not even whether it's funny or whether it's serious. It's just, like I said, it's not a really important distinction. Does Tolkien use wordplay? Yeah. Yeah. Does he play on double meanings? Yeah, totally. He does. Um, He's just not totally incorrigible about it. He doesn't. He doesn't say a thing just in order to get to a point where he lands on a pun, right? Um, but um, anyway, okay. Last one. Second troll song. Oops, no, wrong swipe there. Okay. All right, from Taliesin here. The discussion of the troll song and Tolkien's use of the word "larn," uh, right? And he gave him the boot to larn him. Right, brought back fond memories I have of my grandfather. He used the word "larn" instead of "teach" all the time. I questioned him about it once because I assumed he was using the word incorrectly, in the same way some people confuse "imply" and "infer." He informed me without a hint of indignation that he knew very well the difference between "learn" and "teach," and that "larn" was just a different word for "teach." He came from Newcastle in Northeast England, and the Geordie dialect has a distinct vocabulary, so I took him at his word with only slight reservations. Several years later, I was reading a book by Melvin Bragg, The Adventure of English, highly recommended, where the author explained that learn was not necessarily a misuse of learn, but especially in the north of England, was instead a use of the Old English larn, which means to teach which has somehow remained in use in the North for the last thousand years or so. So my question is, given Tolkien's mastery of the English language, do we think he uses larn, uh, i.e. larn, as part of the Northern English dialect that pervades the song, or as a misuse of learn to demonstrate the ignorance slash lower class of Tom? Okay, great question. Uh, so first of all, would uh, Tolkien have known about this dialectical feature of Northern England? Absolutely, yes. Tolkien made a professional study of dialects of English. So yes, I have absolutely no questions uh, that Tolkien would have known that full well. That is known that that word was in usage in Northern dialects and therefore used it as part, as you say, of the, the sort of generally Northern dialect that is used uh, in the Troll Song. The more complicated question. So there, I've again, like, did he know about lasting? Right? Was he making a, a a joke about lasting lame? There, as we were discussing in the last slide, can't really be sure about that. I don't think there's really much, uh, you know, to to be able to argue really firmly one way or the other. Here, though, I think it's pretty clear. First of all, again, this is not like just a particular piece of vocabulary. This is like something right up his street, right? Some right, right, something right in his in his professional wheelhouse, right? Uh, and that is uh, English dialects um, and English dialect studies and the links between uh, English dialects and uh, you know like the way that those uh, dialects have grown out of uh, older forms of English and everything. I mean, this is exactly the kind of thing that he studied. Um, anyway, so. I, I have very little doubt that he knew full well about this, and it's very clear that he is deliberately invoking a particular dialect in this song, right? In the in the uh, in in the dialect of the song, that I think is clear. The question, therefore, the more complicated question, um, is what does it mean, right? What is he suggesting by this? What is he suggesting about Tom? And, of course, we can't avoid the question, what is he suggesting about Sam, right, the poet, the writer of these lines? Um, so let's take those things one thing at a time. What is he suggesting about uh, Tom? Is he, um, 
is he is when Tom is saying Larnim, is he showing that Tom is ignorant or is he showing that Tom is northern? First of all, we must first acknowledge the fact that um, those two things are not widely separate in English tradition, right? I mean, uh, it is a, and it's not just like, this is actually fairly stable, like from the late Middle Ages on. Um, you can still see it in the Renaissance. You can still see it in the 18th century. You can still see it in the 19th century, right? Um, that is the association between education and sophistication and the cities, especially London, uh, almost exclusively London in many cases, but certainly the other cities and, you know, ignorance uh, and uh, backwardness uh, with people who live out in the country. Right. Um, so that's uh, um, the two things that is uh, uh, th there's almost but not quite um, not quite uh, uh, an identity between those two things. That is to have an accent which shows that you are a country bumpkin is to suggest that you probably don't have a whole, not nearly as much book learning, right, as somebody with a more sophisticated uh, town accent is going to have, right? I mean, that's, that's again, you can see that, um, you can see that trend, right, um, that, um, uh, that association. I get, you can see it in 19th century literature. You can see it in 18th century literature. You can see it in 16th century literature. You can see it in 14th century literature. Um, it, that's, it's just, that's, that's, that's pretty stable. Right. Um, so I'm not sure that there's a whole lot to choose between ignorant slash, um, Northern ultimate, again, being from the sticks, which you like, let's face it. The North is the sticks, uh, for the, you know, London, uh, London eccentric, uh, English, you know, English world for like the majority of, uh, of, of time, of modern time. Um, so anyway, okay. So again, I don't think that there's, there's too much to choose between those two things. So what is he saying about Sam? So first of all, Sam, is Sam delivering this song, this poem in his own normal dialect, right? Um, keep in mind, of course, I'm not meaning to insult anybody. I'm not saying people from outside London actually are more ignorant. I'm just saying that association is very standard. Anyway, okay. Um, exactly. They're uncouth villains, Matt. I couldn't have said it, but I wouldn't have said it like that. But, uh, you know, anyway. Um, <laughs> okay. <laughs> Anyhow. Um, uh, so... Back to Sam. Uh, Sam. Yes, the poem is made up by Sam. But but my question is, is the dialect of the poem Sam's dialect or is Sam adopting a dialect or perhaps intensifying a dialect for poetic purposes? Right. Is this poetic license on Sam's part? Is he, Sam, not Tolkien, is Sam deliberately doing dialect in this song? I would argue, yes, he is. Um, uh, I think that he, yeah, trifle, exact, I do think that Sam is, uh, is code switching here in this poem. I, 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 I think that's pretty clear. Because I think that the, the dialect of this song is much thicker than Sam's dialect. Sam is speaks in an observably different dialect than the other characters, right? Than the other hobbits. But I think that this song is almost as observably different from Sam's normal dialect as Sam's normal dialect is from the other hobbits. That might be an overstatement, but I think it's... Um, I think it's... Uh, um, pretty close, pretty close to the truth here. Um, again, think of all of the things that 
the dialectical things that we see happening in the uh, in the poem that we don't see happening in Sam's normal conversation. Sam doesn't ever say axe, right? Um, uh, it, we don't see him doing that, right? Um, he doesn't use the word larn. Uh, that's just, it's not how he normally talks. Um, uh, anyway, so, um, yeah, anyway, it's, I, it's, it's not that I think it's an absolutely radical difference, but again, I, th I think that we can come up with, even with a, a fairly brief study, and I'm no expert on dialects, so, you know, I, I, I am very ready to be uh, uh, further informed by people who have made more of a study of this than I have. But I think I could point to a, a number of examples uh, of dialectical instances in Sam's song here, which are observably more extreme than his normal conversation. So if then we proceed um, on the concept, right, uh, that Sam is adopting a dialect here. Why this dialect? What's going on? And I agree that, you know, the trend, what you guys have been uh, pointing to here in the comments, this is totally, I think, that the fact that it's a northern dialect, I think, is no accident. Sam's family is from the north. Um, that is very clear. We know where his family come, comes from. It's in the north farthing. They haven't been uh, down in Hobbiton all that long. Of course, you'll remember Sam has already alluded to the fact that he, you know, he has uh, uh, cousins who still live and operate up in the north farthing, right? So he's not at all far removed um, from uh, uh, from his family who still lives in the north farthing. Um Erokeb says that his guess w would be that this is Sam mimicking Cousin Hal uh, up in the North Farthing. Quite possibly. Quite possibly. Something like that. Um, I think, again, even even um, uh, the gaffer's talk, which is, I think, slightly more dialectical than Sam's, is still not, does not have some of the much broader features. Uh, again, like axing, right? Again, this is one of, to me, one of the most obvious ones. Um uh, we don't see that kind of thing from uh, from the gaffer either, right? Um, but uh, anyway, um, so I do think that uh, it is not for no reason that uh, Tolkien has Sam adopting a northern dialect uh, or sort of projecting a northern dialect into this particular song. And honestly, I suspect that that's a big part of the humor, right? Tom, with his big boots on in this poem, is... Well, I was going to call him the butt of the joke, but that would be a little too on the nose, wouldn't it? Um, anyway, he's... he's, It's, you know, the, 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 the joke's on him ultimately in the end, right? Oh, look, darn it, there I go again. It's really hard to avoid that. Anyhow, point is, um, we're kind of laughing at Tom, at least a little, you know, at least a little bit, at least a little good naturedly at the end. Um, and for Sam, who I, I think it's pretty clear the other three hobbits in question are all going to know is from a northern family, that he's doing it in his own sort of northern family home dialect kind of makes this uh, funnier. Right. In a humble kind of way. Right. Sam, who is kind of himself still half a hick, uh, it, you know, making fun of uh, exactly the sort of, uh, you know, brand of hickdom that his family <laughs> comes from. Like, that's kind of cool. Right. That's 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 kind of funny. Um, so uh, anyway, um, <laughs> that's. Oh man, I see. There's, uh, I see. There's, 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 there's a whole bunch of punning going. I don't know if, if just uh, talking about puns for a while has uh, opened the, <laughs> the floodgates here, but uh, wow. Okay. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> um, uh, <laughs> so yeah. So anyway, that 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 seems to me part of what's going on, and that seems to me a really delightful. Uh, uh, kind of feature to it. And by the way, keep in mind, keep in mind, this is all retcon on Tolkien's part, right? Um, 
the Sam Gamgee's family coming from the North Farthing and stuff. Honestly, if uh, if one thing um, if one thing comes from another. I think it's the other way around. I mean, we can say now, right? We can say, oh, well, Sam clearly adopts a northern dialect because his family was from the North Farthing, right? I think, of course, from a historical standpoint, um, uh, I, th- I think that it almost certainly works the other way. That is, from a, from a real-world chronology standpoint, it almost certainly works the other way around, right? That Because the, the troll poem came first, and was in an, was written in a northern dialect long before uh, you know the character of Sam Gamgee uh, was invented or the story of the Lord of the Rings begun uh, decades before that in fact like twenty years before that well, yeah twenty ish years uh, a little bit less than twenty years uh, before he embarked on the whole thing certainly before he invented the character of Sam um, so anyway. Um, I, I again, I, I, I kind of suspect that when, and this is just a suspicion, that when Tolkien came to develop a family history uh, for Sam, that placing the Gamgees in the North was, I bet, influenced by the fact that Sam had been given the troll song. Um, which, by the way, um, I think is... Uh, um, it's interesting... That we need to mention, because I think I forgot to mention this last time, that that happened not, I won't say by chance, but it could have been different. Um, I'm pretty sure we mentioned this at the time when we were back in Bree, but of course the troll song, this song, this, this, this same poem uh, was originally in the very first draft, the song that was given to Frodo in the Prancing Pony. So that the song that he was going to stand up on the tables and sing and get over enthusiastically involved with on the second recitation was going to be the troll song such that when the, when it was time to pantomime the enthusiastic kick in the, in the pants, that's when Frodo was going to slip and fall and accidentally put on the ring. Um, And that got shifted, of course, when he decided to do uh, The Man in the Moon Stayed Up Too Late instead, which was a little bit more uh, of a... So on the one hand, like topically, The Man in the Moon song uh, is more relevant, right? I mean, it's about uh, about drinking in a tavern, right? So that that really works. Um, However, uh, the... Troll song, of course, as we discussed and as we uh, uh, heard and sang, uh, is much more suited for tavern song, right? So when he went to give Frodo a song to sing uh, in the common room at the Prancing Pony, his first impulse was the Stone Troll because it's a great pub song, right? Um, anyway, uh, so 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 just think. If not for that shift, if he hadn't shifted the troll song away from Frodo and the Prancing Pony, Frodo would have had it. And who knows? Who knows where Sam Gamgee's family would have come from then uh, if Sam Gamgee had not ultimately been the source of this poem. Um, but um, anyway, OK. Um, yeah. Uh, so, oh, I, and oh, by the way, so I saw several of you talking about sort of different uh, kind of rustic American accents and things uh, and the use of uh, the use of learn instead of teach uh, as evidenced in, in, in some of those. I'm mostly not talking about that because American dialects are not super relevant uh, to Tolkien's word choices. Uh, it's not that he was totally uninterested in American dialects, but and Tolkien was not super interested in America, full stop. Uh, so it's just it's, it's it it doesn't come in being super relevant. The one thing that I would say again, just to go back to the 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 very basic philological question here about the implications of Larn. Um, again, to me, I kind of come back to the. I continue to come back to the scene that I meant the 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 moment that I mentioned last week. Uh, when we talked about this line, and that is that famous moment in the Wind of the Willows when ba- when uh, when Badger uh, uses the word "learn" in this way. You know, when he says we're going to learn the weasels, right? And, uh, and and Mole tries to correct him, and is like, "Oh, Daniel, that's poor grammar, right? Don't you mean teach?" And he says, "No, I don't mean teach. I mean learn them. We're going to learn them." And it's interesting here, especially thinking back to the Anglo-Saxon root, which this is probably. Um, 
uh, you know, which 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 I I, I suspect Badger's usage uh, of uh, recalling as well. Uh, the interesting thing to me about that moment is Badger's insistence. Right again, it's uh, just like with Taliesin's grandfather here. It's not a question of ignorance, right, or knowledge. Uh, Badger knows full well what is the correct and proper thing to say. But of course, you notice the the point that Badger is making is that there is a usage of learn. Right, which may be considered improper in polite society, polished society, like city society, right? Um, but which is more evocative and appropriate, right? To learn them, right? To learn somebody uh, is like that. That's more. That's uh, teaching is you know formal. Badger's like, look, we don't want to go in and, and instruct the weasels. That is not what's going to happen here, right? Uh, we're going to go in and we're going to learn them, right? There's, uh, there obviously uh, is a whole weight of connotation with that. Uh, it's a word which obviously has much more flexible kinds of associations, right? Which is more capable of uh, uh, experience expansion right uh into uh into in, into various things um definitely more forceful finn it's clear in 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 badger's usage that it's more that it's more forceful so it's it's interesting for me to see here and i know several of you are bringing up um gaffer gamgee's usage of learn um incorrectly right you know again by formal english uh when he talks about mr bilbo learning sam his letters right and it's of course very interesting to me that when he says learn he means teach <laughs> right bilbo doesn't doesn't learn doesn't learn sam right in the badgerian in the bad what's the adjectival form badgerian sense um uh he he, he teaches him presumably right um so uh, it's uh, the kinds of implications that we can see, the kinds of connotations that Badger's not only seeking but relishing, right, in using the word learn there in that context, clearly are not relevant to, to the gaffer at all. Um, yeah. Anyway, okay. Um, cool. All right, let's keep going. Or rather, let's start. That's what we should do. Um so I've put up the I, I I have the troll slides, but we're not gonna we're not gonna do this again. This is the poem that we talked about last time. I just wanted to have it for reference in case anyone I wanted to refer, refer back to it, which I am almost certain to do, uh, because I want to talk briefly about the original poem. I think this is really fun. So Perowin Podex is the the name that he originally gave uh, to the poem as it was published in Songs for the Philologists, uh, which I've mentioned, the geekiest publication ever. Um, so here's the original version. Tell me what you notice, right? Tell me what's, what things really jump out at you uh, as you are uh, uh, hear the original here. A troll sat alone on a seat of... St okay, I gotta sing it, because you gotta sing it, right? Sing with me. A troll sat alone on a seat of stone and munched and mumbled a bare old bone and long and long he sat there alone and seen no man nor mortal Ortal portal, and long and long he had sat there alone and seen no man nor mortal. Up came Tom with his big boots on. Hello, says he, pray what is yon? It looks like the leg, I mean, Uncle John, as should be a lion in churchyard. Search yard, birch yard. It looks like the leg, of my Uncle John, as should be a lion in churchyard. Young man says, troll, that bone I stole, but what be bones when mayhap the soul in heaven on high hath an aureole as big and bright as a bonfire, on fire, yon fire, in heaven on high hath an aureole as big and bright as a bonfire. Says Tom Odd's teeth, tis my belief, if bonfire there be, tis underneath. For old man John was as proper a thief as ever wore black on a Sunday. Grundy Monday, for old man John was as proper a thief as ever wore black on a Sunday. But still I don't see what is that to thee, with me kith and me kin a makin' free. So get to hell and axe leave a he, afore thou gnaws me nuncle, uncle, buncle. So get to hell and axe leave a he, afore thou gnaws me nuncle. 
In the proper place, upon the base, Tom boots him right, but alas, that race hath a stonier seat than its stony face, so he rued that root on the rumpo, lumpo, bumpo, hath a stonier seat than its stony face, so he rued that root on the rumpo. Now Tom goes lame since home he came, and his bootless foot is grievous game, but Troll's old seat is much the same, and the bony bone from its owner, donor, boner, but Troll's old seat is much the same, and the bony bone from its owner. All right, so uh, what, um, what do you notice? What do you notice about this song? What do you notice about the differences between this old, old version, the first version, and the later version, right? Um, ah, uh, Henario, uh, you missed our class two weeks ago where we did a sing-along with Tolkien himself. We have a, we have a recording. Uh, go look this up on YouTube, uh, Henario. Look up the Stone Troll song, and you can hear Tolkien singing it. Uh, and that's the tune that he uh, that he sings, uh, that he sings it. So cool. All right. Um, so what do you notice? What do you notice? Uh, lots of people noticing the, <laughs> yeah, Amy. Yeah. Uh, Amy says at first I thought it said Pedro and Podex. You know how many times I had to convince my, I, I was, I was, uh, doing this, I was typing this on my phone at first, uh, but like autocorrect corrected that to Pedro several times. Uh, I, I actually, I had Pedro and Podex up on a slide at one point and I'm like, no, darn it. Anyway. Um, okay. So lots of, lots of Christian references. Yes. Uh, several people pointing out, um, that's a, yes. Uh, one of the, the biggest and most striking examples, right? Even for Dauntless, the swearing, right? That we get, um, I don't, uh, mean the, the get to hell line, which is, you know, um, uh, it's a play on crude. I mean, it, it is a little bit crude. It's not exactly cussin, you know, but, uh, because he's in fact, uh, advising him, uh, that the best place he could go to, uh, uh, ask leave of his uncle would be hell where he suspects his uncle is currently in residence. Right. So, um, he's not merely insulting the troll, but he's also insulting the troll. Right. Um, but, um, anyway, so, um, but odds teeth, that's the swear word, right? Um, uh, says Tom, odds teeth, tis my belief. Uh, that's that's a, that's a, that's a swear word. That's an old swear word. That's a, you can see people in Shakespeare saying that. That's a medieval swear word, um, which is um, uh, I, by, I, I, swearing swearing by parts of God's body being a vague reference to the incarnation, uh, and therefore sort of vaguely blasphemous. Uh, they were not like horrible, horrible swear words, um, but they were not, uh, definitely not proper uh, language there. Um, Odds Bodikins is exactly in that same line, uh, Fourth Dauntless, exactly, which just means God's body. Uh, and it was a, you know, sort of a bastardization of God's body. Um, but um, anyhow, yeah, so... Um, uh, all of those, so all of those religious references, even back to, uh, churchyard, right? And it's really fun to see Tolkien going back, you know, in places like that, we can see when we compare the old poem with the new poem, Tolkien carefully going through and eliminating the, uh, the Christian references, right? For the sake of, of, uh, historical accuracy, right? Uh, to avoid anachronism. Um, so you wouldn't have a churchyard, right? Uh, Sam wouldn't be singing about a churchyard. Uh, so he replaces that with graveyard, right? Same number of syllables, same concept, but inst so instead of birchyard, you get paveyard, right? No problems. Um, but of course, then there are deeper issues, most notably, of course, the status uh, of old Uncle John, <laughs> right? Um, and first of all, notice that the, to me, the most striking moment in the whole poem is stanza three, when the troll says, um, tries to like butter Tom up, 
right? By saying, um, but what be bones? Instead of trying to argue that the bones are insignificant because his uncle's done with them, right? And surely he wouldn't grudge them to an old broken down old troll, right? Which is pretty much his move trying to evoke pity. Um, in the, in Sam's version, in the original version, he kind of goes there, but instead he, but what be bones when mayhap this soul in heaven on high hath an aureole as big and bright as a bonfire. Now an aureole, of course, is a halo, right? So he's saying, oh, doubtless your uncle is up in heaven now, right? And not only just in heaven, right? But you know, his his halo in heaven is so bright it's like a bonfire, right? So doubtless, you know, the 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 sanctity of your dear Uncle John is such that he's clearly done with his um um he's clearly done with his body and would not be looking back, right? Uh so uh and, and someone that saintly is probably also like self sacrificing right? And generous and humble and things. So he wouldn't be offended, right? He wouldn't, he wouldn't grudge the poor old troll. Um, uh, anyway, so, um, yeah. And Eric Hebb points out that the, uh, uh, the young man says the troll is also much more, uh, much more formal, more high register than, uh, my lad, which is how the troll talks to him in Sam's version. Right. So, the troll is altogether more polite. Um, and again, I lo- he, he, he flatters Tom initially. I don't know that I take from the flattery there in stanza three. You could just take it as mockery, right? Um, so, you know, you needn't go too far with it, of course. But, um, but I'm tempted to hear there in that stanza, uh, especially in conjunction, Eric, I think it's the it's the formality of the increased formality of his language, the politeness of his language in, in both senses, really. Um, the politeness of his language, which leads me to hear that the troll is sounding a little bit more cringing, if that makes sense. Right. And notice what is missing in conjunction with that. What's missing is the turnabout, right? Um, you know, for a couple of pins, says troll in grins, I'll eat thee too and gnaw thy shins. We don't get that at all. Exactly, Lincoln. He doesn't try to eat him, right? Um, at no point does the troll suddenly turn around and become the ferocious and fearful predator again, right? Or, you know, like, not that he ever was before, but that is invoked by the concept of, of troll, right? Um, uh, Matt asks, okay, a serious-ish question. Oh, that's always kind of dangerous. Is this a subtle religious debate? After all, the bodily resurrection would require the troll leave the bone alone, but he's arguing for something less medieval in outlook. Yes, the question of, does, in fact, your brother need his bones? Um, and is there any... It, w- they would evoke uh, a debate, potentially. Um, do I think that this poem, this original poem, is making a particular stand on that point? I don't necessarily think so. Um, but uh, I guess, Matt, I would go so far as to say I think it's kind of part of the joke that the troll's response is not only to make an argument, is not only to butter Tom up, but to um, to kind of invite that sort of debate, right? You know, the idea that, you know, Matt, if even one theologian in the audience, right? Or, you know, who's reading songs for the philologist sort of bridles at that point and is like, but, but wait a second, right? Then like, that's it. That's, that's kind of the punchline, right? Remember songs for the philologists, right? This was not intended for wide circulation, right? This, the primary target audience of this book really kind of has to be their colleagues at Leeds, right? So, um, so Elway, was he basically trolling any theologians who heard it? Yeah, something like that. That's kind of what I'm getting at. Yeah, exactly. Um, uh, JJ was just saying the same thing. Exactly. Exactly. Um, but of course, Tom reverses the thing on him, right? So we do get another reversal. Notice that same sort of movement of, of, uh, uh, of sort of unexpected reversals. Um, we get fewer of them, but we get that same kind of movement in the original poem. Tom reverses it on the troll, right? He uh, takes his flattery. Not only, ex- not only does he not accept his flattery, but he, he reverses it, right? Uh, for, and and n- notice the, the one legitimate curse word, 
right? Odd's teeth, which is again, fairly minor. Um, uh, somebody was asking before, um, uh, let's see, uh, um, blah, blah, blah. Who was that? Who was asking that? Is that a sin? I didn't, I'm missing it. The answer, yes. It, would that be taking the, the Lord's name in vain? Yes, that is a sin, and that's why it's a sin. Um, but it's a minor sin. It, it's like those are not. It's not like a huge deal. Uh, these are these are minor. These are minor swears. Um, but um, anyway, the fact that Tom c comes in with a, with a curse word there totally undermines the whole I'm praising your uncle because of his great sanctity, right? Um, showing that not only does Tom disagree with the troll's assessment of Uncle John's probable sanctity, but that he himself, Tom, obviously doesn't really uh, value it, right? As he, his response to that uh, is a sort of, um, you know, it was, is this, is this minor light, light blasphemy, Tony? Exactly. Um, if bonfire there be tis underneath, uh, for old man, John was as proper a thief. Um, uh, in a, one of those rare moments. Uh, so this, the text of this poem is included in the return of the shadow. It's also included in the appendix of the new Hammond and Skull edition of the, uh, the, um, uh, Adventures of Tom Bombadil, the poetry collection. Uh, you can find it in either one of those two places. And um, in The Return of the Shadow, Christopher Tolkien makes one of his rare personal recollections uh, uh, when he's commenting on the troll song and uh, alluding to his own delight as a child um, in those two lines. Odds teeth, tis my belief, if bonfire there be, tis underneath, um, that he found this uh, sort of witty reversal by Tom uh, that, you know, his his halo is not as bright as a bonfire. There might be a bonfire involved, but it's not that kind of bonfire, if you know what I mean. Uh, this sort of uh, wit of this turn by Tom uh, and just the, 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 the play and the sound of these lines were things that, uh, that he, Christopher Tolkien really loved when he was, uh, when he was young. Um, uh, and I, I, I too think it's uh, pretty funny. I'm also interested in the fact that that line, that second line is one of the most awkward um, metrically in the entire song it says Tom odds teeth. Tis my belief. If bonfire there be tis underneath that, you hear it at the beginning, if bonfire there be is really hard to reconcile with the rhythm of the song. It just does. It, it fits less well, even in other places where we hear the, 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 the stress vary from the rhythm in making a little syncopation, right? Um, there it's, it's, it's different, right? But one of the consequences, uh, is that it shifts the amp. So here's another little wordplay moment, right? Um, the, um, I find the say, says Tom odds teeth. Tis my belief. If on fire, there be tis underneath the rhythm of the song wants you to land on fire right? To place the emphasis on fire instead of bon, which is where it normally is, right? Bonfire. Um, but the song, the rhythm, right? The melody wants you to say bonfire. Um, and, uh, I think that's interesting. That is, uh, whenever, uh, whenever the rhythm of the line is at odds with the nor with the sort of the natural rhythm of the words. Uh, that's that's usually something that a uh, a, a good a, a very a, you know a sort of a, a poet who is aware of playing with the sounds of words, which is hopefully most poets um, are really conscious of uh, and uh, uh, and often doing on purpose. Shakespeare did this a lot. A lot of the great poets did this a lot. Um, Okay, Elway says, would Tolkien himself have considered using odds teeth here a sin for himself because he was a uh, he was a Christian? Um, no, I don't think so. Um, and I think the main thing is because I mean it's 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 historical, 
right? I mean, like, yeah, when people, you know, said things like zoons, they were swearing by the wounds of Christ, his wounds. Uh, and when people talk about, you know, when people use the word bloody as an adjective, uh, uh, as sort of an expletive adjective, um, it meant the blood of Christ. Um, but once you're a certain distance from when those words actually had any meaning, I mean, it's somebody uh, earlier on referred to Gadzooks, right? Which was, again, another, um, uh, another, it is derived from one of these same kinds of things. Is, in, is, is anyone utter that word with the intention of blasphemy anymore? I mean, even the historical connection to blasphemy is, uh, hard to trace in some cases. Right. Um, so, uh, you know, it's, um, uh, I, I don't think th these had become sort of historical and linguistic curios by Tolkien's time. And I don't think he felt any guilt in using it in the poetry. Um, now would he talk that way himself in private, right? Would he use that as an expletive in conversation? Probably not. Um, exact for Thalus, if, uh, uh, if you two were thinking of, of Shaggy saying zoons, uh, it, or, you know, zounds, uh, in Scooby-Doo, then yes, you're thinking of the same thing I am. Uh, is Shaggy guilty of blasphemy there? In a very technical sense, yes. But if Shaggy in Scooby-Doo, yeah, zoinks, exactly. Uh, if they're thinking of, if, if, if anybody, if any modern person who uses any of those, uh, words or anything derived from them is, you know, thinking of uh, uttering some petty blasphemy on the incarnation. I'm, pre I'm pretty, I'm, I'm going to be pretty skeptical, right? Um, anyway, uh, uh, so yeah, so no, I don't think that Tolkien would have felt guilty uh, using it. Um, okay, anyway, we will... Um, yeah, exactly. Tony, exactly. I, 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 bloody does have a blasphemous origin. We're talking about the blood of Christ. Um, but again, I, I mean, honestly, to, that's one that I use. I, I, it's a favorite expletive of mine. Um, but I mean, I, I don't know. I'm not, in fact, swearing, uh, you know, blaspheming the blood of Christ when I utter that. I, you know, again, I just, I don't feel like it has that cultural weight anymore at all. Um, um, in fact, uh, it, you guys, many of you know enough of my personal reading history to be unsurprised when I tell you when I use the word bloody as an adjective in my own private conversation, which I sometimes do, uh, what I am primarily thinking of is not only Dracula, but Van Helsing's delightful uh, recitation of the 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 swearing of the sailors in the harbor when he talks about uh, you know uh, the, how they could not uh, enter the ship uh, with with bloom and with blood. Um, I, I always think of Van Helsing's attempt to render English swear words, and and it's and it's very fine. It's what I'm always thinking of in the back of my mind when I use the word bloody. Um, anyway, yeah. Um, so, um, yeah, <laughs> I see many people coming out with, uh, a, a very, very minor expletives, which are all derived. I mean, ultimately, you know, uh, blasphemy is, is like the number one root of swear words, right? Um, uh, if it's not blasphemy, it's, it's sex. That's most of it. Right. Anyway, um, trifle, we're a little off topic. But it's it's in the poem, right? We got to talk about this or excrement, Valori. Exactly. That's 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 the other uh, sort of uh, strain, right? Um, anyhow, that's enough about swear words. Okay. Uh, but another question about the form of the poem. Um, did I just skip them? Uh, the repeated lines. So you know, the first stanza has the full repeated lines. The second one says etc., and the others don't. No, that's how it's represented in the text. Um, uh, I just copied and pasted the uh, the text here, uh, but again, that's just because they're all repeated, and that's one of the major structural differences. As I talked about a little bit at the time, um, what was a, what was originally, and we can see that clearly in the first version of the poem, merely a repeated refrain, right? Um, 
a repeated refra- refrain for the people to recite after you in the pub, right along with you, uh, is changed, uh, and and we get a more complex play on words and meanings, right, with the almost repetition, right, the repetition of the thought, which connects it generally back. Um, uh, uh, w- through its rhyme, right through that penultimate line, uh, to the first three rhymes uh, of the of the poem, as we looked at before. Um. Anyway, cool. Um. <laughs> I see. Oh man, it's sometimes really funny. I have to admit to to hear go and look and um. Uh, so when I see both the Discord channel and the Twitch channel having devolved into other conversations, uh, uh, it's sometimes sometimes kind of funny. Um, uh, so, Lilith, are there other structural differences? Well, that that repetition is the biggest one. Um, we can see there's uh, uh, the the rhyme structure is similar. Right. Again, varying significantly because we don't get those last lines. Um, uh, but yeah, you'll notice also we don't get the uh, the B rhymes. Right. So you'll remember in the original harder than stone is the flesh and bone of a troll that sits in the hills alone. A, A, A. Right. In the first two lines as well. Set your boot to the mountain's root. So we get the B rhymes, the two B rhymes in line three. Right. And that's uh, stable all the way through. We don't get that. Right. Um, it looks like the legamy Uncle John, um, which has uh, which which just continues. Right. So we have just another a rhyme. Um, so rather than um, adding another rhyme couplet there in the third line, um, it merely continues. So the rhymes go two a rhymes in the, in the first line and then a a uh, at the end of the, the, the lines only. Uh, in lines two and three, so the the rhyme structure is much simpler uh, than in uh, uh, than in the, the 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 newer version. He's made it more ornate uh, as time goes on. Um, yeah. Uh, Fourth Thalas asks, is there any chance that Tolkien wanted to blend rhyming couplets with alliterative verse? Is that why there's so much alliteration in the final poem? not really alliterative verse. I mean, it doesn't really have the alliterative feel. Um, uh, so I, not, not like the, the poetic structure of alliterative verse. Um, but there does, it does use more alliteration. And honestly, that's, um, that's, well, it's Northern. I mean, it fits, uh, it demographically, it fits. Um, the north of England is where alliterative verse lasted longest uh, in its uh, real living form. Um, so, um, yeah, yeah. Um, I think that that's... So again, he's not trying to do alliterative verse as a poetic structure, um, but that he's using, that he adds more alliteration as it goes seems to me just part of kind of perfecting the dialect, really. Um, yeah, yeah, um, yeah, there is, as, as Bruce is pointing out, uh, still alliteration, uh, in the old poem as well. Um, long and long he had sat there alone. Yes, definitely. Uh, many a year he had gnawed it near. Yes. Um, but, um, we don't get, uh, uh, it's not as persistent in the old poem as in the new poem. Um, so I have an idea. It's a crazy idea. You guys ready for this idea? Let's talk about some pros. Okay, here we go. Well, that's a warning to us all, laughed Mary. It is as well you used a stick and not your hand, Strider. Where did you come by that, Sam? asked Pippin. I've never heard those words before. Sam muttered something inaudible. It's out of his own head, of course, said Frodo. I am learning a lot about Sam Gamgee on this journey. First he was a conspirator, now he's a jester. He'll end up by becoming a wizard, or a warrior. I hope not, said Sam. I don't want to be neither. Okay. <laughs> not ready yet, says JJ. I know, I know. Um, 
is still chanting for Gorfindel. Hey, who knows? Maybe we'll make it. <laughs> okay. Um, uh, Mary's laughter. Remember, it's. The, I think this really sort of says a lot for um, uh, both Mary and Pippin, right? That they took Strider's joke really well, actually, right? There was a non-zero chance that they could have been kind of ticked off, right? I mean, here they were trying to participate, right? <laughs> trying to trying to contribute uh, for really one of the first times we see them really contributing. And, you know, Aragorn, as we've discussing, is trolling them, right? And now, um, you know... Uh, they turn out to be, you know, the butt of his joke, Strider's joke. Um, Mary kind of sort of tries to turn it, but I don't think he's tur turning it around on Strider. Mike, I think that's a much better way to characterize it. Um, he's including Strider in the laughing here, right? He's inviting Strider to uh, to laugh along with them at this, right? Um, but you'll notice, of course, what Mary does is... By saying to Strider, it's as well you use his stick and not your hand, right? He's putting Strider in the Tom role from the song, which is kind of tweaking Strider a little bit, right? Uh, like, boy, you know, uh, it's, it's, uh, uh, it's a good thing. You narrowly missed being Tom with his big boots, Strider. Right. Um, playing that, uh, uh, that kind of, that kind of role. Um, so yeah, no, I, I, I agree, Tony, this kind of good natured ribbing, I think is, uh, uh, is a normal thing, but again, interesting that Mary is including Strider there that, you know, although ironically the, um, uh, you know, his attempt, their attempt, Mary and Pippin's attempt, uh, to be, you know, important contributing members of the party has kind of backfired. It kind of didn't backfire in a sense, right? Strider uh, has kind of, it seems, made the connection with them. And it's one of the first inst instances that we clearly see of that. We've seen uh, Strider's relationship with Sam developing in the way that he takes him aside and the conversations they've had about Frodo. Um, so I think it's interesting to see Mary responding to, or uh, including Mike, to use your word, uh, Strider here. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, Lilith does point out that it, it seems that Mary's still slightly dwelling on the fact that they were tricked by Strider before the song began. Yeah, yeah, no, I agree. Um, I agree. Um, <laughs> I, 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 I agree. I think Strider would have had to slap the troll pretty hard for the joke to stick. Yeah, you're right. Yeah, Eric Hebb. See, the puns just, like, we talked about puns. So they, you know, it's always a danger, right, uh, in uh, uh, conversations of this kind, uh, you know, uh, uh, chat room discussions of this kind. But, um, you know, having evoked it, uh, we can't uh, possibly put that back in the bottle here tonight. Um, uh, yeah, but Tony, I agree. The sense that, that we get here, even though Strider doesn't say anything, in the wake of this conversation, right? He's the only one who doesn't say anything in this passage that we have here, right? But it, there is a sense, as Tony's suggesting, of an of an us all, right? Instead of the hobbits plus Strider, um, and I think that's really that's really fun. Now, Bruce, I agree with you. The progression from conspirator to jester to wizard or warrior is interesting. Jester is always the one that kind of puzzled me most. Um, And and Bricktails, I think it's you know Bruce that uh, I think it's the progression that made it puzzle me is is the thing that mostly made me puzzled about it right um, it doesn't so conspirator you know with conspirator on one end of a progression and wizard or warrior at the other end what's in the middle like what's halfway from conspirator to wizard or warrior right jester wouldn't have been my choice. Now, yes, entertainer. Um, I also assume entertainer rather than fool. Um, I think that I always originally associated the word jester merely with fool, which 
I took to be, again, sort of ribbing on uh, Frodo's part, right? That he's, you know, joking with Sam and calling him a jester. Um, but, but I mean, it, the, the word jester can be used uh, not inexplicitly that way. Um, uh, but just as like more, more like a storyteller and, and, and singer and entertainer more broadly. Uh, sure. Um, I don't know. Of course, we don't have any context, right? It's the only time that I'm aware of that we see a hobbit use the word jester, so we have no other way to contextualize the implications of that within hobbit culture, right? Um, but, um, uh, yeah, um, so it's hard to, th hard to know for sure exactly what's associated with it. I don't think it would be out of place um, if Frodo were calling him a fool in the sense of a performer who, you know, tries to get people to laugh and is possibly commenting on, you know, uh, commenting satirically on other people present, right? I don't think that would be wildly inappropriate for him to say of Sam here. And there is a sense in which one can imagine that that would fit in the progression, right? Um, and no, Bricktails, we never do get it. And there are, are there any fools? Does anyone ever have a fool? Do we ever see anybody who is a fool? Uh, I mean, in the, in this, in the professional sense, right? A professional fool, we have people who are foolish, right? But do we get any professional fools? I can't think of any, um, I can't think of any fools, um, yeah, yeah, um, yeah. And Tony, of course, is 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 right in recalling. Of course, the word "jest" means uh, story. I mean, it's a word Tolkien himself used, like uh, in the you know for for talking about the Lay of Lathian, um, you know, of his own poems, which clearly were not jests in the modern sense. Um, they weren't jokes, right? They were jests in the old sense, meaning. Uh, a long form narrative, right? Um, so yes, in that sense, Elway Dairon was a jester, right? So was Maglor, um, not in the other sense. Um, James, well remembered, good. James and Matt were both recalling that uh, Gandalf says that Saruman should have been the king's jester. Uh, yes, yes. Talk about earning his bread in stripes too by mocking his counselors. So mockery being a so the concept is there. The concept is there. Yes. We never see it in action. I mean, again, not like professionally. Um Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's good. That's good. I had forgotten that. Of course, it's not a hobbit using it, but, um, yeah. Yeah, Bruce says he can't imagine Denethor employing a jester. No, not exactly. Um, uh, yeah, yeah, um, he wouldn't have done. Well, but again, if you... So there, there are a couple different ways, I think, that we can imagine um, Sam being termed as a jester here and thinking of it in terms of this progression, right? Um, one, to go from conspirator to, so let's say, jester in sense A, the older sense, that is of storyteller, of singer who sings songs and stories. Um, that is a step up from conspirator, Right, conspirator is just someone who does something devious, right? Um, and a jester is someone who is, that's clearly on a different level, right? Um, though not quite as high as wizard or warrior, so that's that's much more clear. Um, uh, then you get um, jester in the other sense, in the, f in the, in the fool sense, um, you know, the, 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 the sense in which Gandalf clearly uses the term when talking about Saruman. And even that, 
one could imagine that being a step uh, a step up in a sense, a progression forward from conspirator. Um, it's still um, um, it's still a uh, um, there's more sort of wit and subtlety in it. I mean, being a satirical figure uh, like a fool, right? Being a fool doesn't mean you're stupid, right? Usually not. Uh, quite the reverse, really. Um, but um, so it would show a sort of career change for Sam, right? From gardener to conspirator uh, to jester. Um, uh I think, of course, of Frodo's, the words that he just said, right? It's out of his own head, of course. He's speaking of Sam's creativity, as we would say, right? Uh, Sam's wit, as, uh, you know, might have been said several hundred years back. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, If he means Jester in the sense of a fool, like a king's fool, then I would take that not to be a progression, but like a variety of things, like that he has filled several very different roles, but not necessarily progressing upwards uh, in a linear fashion. If he means Jester in the other sense uh, of storyteller, it may well be a much more stepwise progression that he's thinking of for for Sam here. Um, yeah. Erukeb says, um, uh, it's the aura warrior that always amuses me as it seems to imply that Sam becoming a wizard is more likely than him becoming a warrior. Yeah. And Erukeb, of course, as I'm recalling in my subtitle to this slide here, it also always reminds me of the Hobbit, right? Of chapter one of the Hobbit, when Gandalf explains that he looked for a warrior, but couldn't find one or even a hero, right? A uh, hero, of course, uh, so warrior, um, the thing that the wizard in the Hobbit said he was trying to find to send along on their journey with them, um, uh, is explicitly evoked in hero which is the other thing that he couldn't find and wished to find, right, is, is, the, is the thing that's not stated here, right? But of course, Sam is going to become not only a warrior, but also a hero uh, before the end. Um, and I agree, of course, the, the, the delicious dramatic irony here, of course, Sam is indeed going to become a warrior. Um, uh, and that's... Um, uh, of course, as I say, very delightful uh, as we as we read it. And Arden Cran, you're right. Uh, typically, you would not expect to see a lot of mobility in uh, uh, Hobbit careers, right? Um, you know, the odds of Sam becoming a wizard or a warrior professionally are very, very unlikely, right? Um, uh, there's a good reason why people don't recognize him when he's home wearing his ironmongery. Uh, <laughs> on my short list, potentially, for favorite single words in The Lord of the Rings, uh, the gaffer's use of ironmonger. I don't hold with wearing ironmongery. Um, uh, but anyway, uh, so, so, yeah, I mean, Sam, the, the idea that Sam, who we knew, always knew who he was and what he was, and he no longer is anything what he was before, right? Sam and, or sorry, Mary and Pippin haven't fundamentally changed. They're taller, right? And they've grown up in more than one way, um, but um, they've not, they've not changed. Um, lordly, they are called, right? And lordly, theoretically, they always were. They're now the reality behind their positions, right? Behind their titles uh, from from before. Um, but, um, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, wheel rider. Exactly. That, that line is such a great, line. I don't hold with wearing iron mongery, whether it wear well or no. Yeah, no, I, I agree. I always love that line. Um, yeah, yeah. Anyhow. So, uh, but anyway, Ar Arden Cran, I agree with you. I, and I think that the traditional lack of, mobility 
uh, in the Shire is the primary thing that informs Sam's response. I hope not. I don't want to be neither, right? Um, it's not just that he's saying, uh, that is vastly improbable, Master Frodo, right? That's not his response. I hope not. I hope I don't become those things. I don't want to be either one of those things. I don't want to be a wizard. I don't want to be a warrior, right? And I think one of the, the primary things here is just we, Sam saying, I don't want to change, right? I am who I am. Sam's happy with who he is, right? He doesn't want to become a warrior. He doesn't want to, he doesn't want to go. He just wants to go home and tend his Mr. Frodo's bit of garden, right? I mean, that's... Um, Gardening is his trade, and he's content being a gardener. He doesn't want to be anything else. He doesn't want to be anybody else. Um, and that's what I hear, anyway, when he says, I hope not. Which, which in some ways, is, is an, a, a, perhaps an unexpected um, uh, response, right, on Sam's part. Um, skepticism, right, or like, Mr. Frodo, you shouldn't make fun, right, um, is... Um, uh, would would be one thing, right? That would be merely an expression of his humility um, to say, no, that is unlikely. Uh, no, you're, you're teasing me, Mr. Frodo. Uh, you know, you know that that's never going to happen. That would be merely expressions of humility. I think he does express humility, but it's in a sense a, a more profound kind of humility, right? Humility, which is rooted in his complete contentment, right? Um yeah, yeah. Um, JJ, I agree. The fact that he doesn't currently have a garden to tend doesn't seem to dissuade Sam from continuing to consider himself a gardener. Yeah, of course not, right? It doesn't change who he is, right? How would going on a journey change uh, uh, change who he is, right? I mean, he still remains a gardener, even if he's on this trip, right? Uh, uh, you know, uh, looking after Mr. Frodo. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, Okay, good. Um, well, see, Belongsmond, I'm not sure about that. Belongsmond says, in the scouring of the Shire, it'd say the hobbits become like warriors. Like warriors. That li the like is the word that I would emphasize. They fight uh, to defend their, uh, their, their homes, their land, to, you know, repel the invaders. Um, but they don't become warriors. Remember what it means to be a warrior. Remember Faramir's words, right? Um, you know, loving the arrow for its swiftness and the sword for its sharpness, right? Uh, seeing feats of arms as an end in themselves, right? That's what it means to be a warrior, to have that be your identity, right? If somebody comes up to you and says, you know, who are you? What are you? And you're like, I'm a warrior, right? Just as Eowyn, in fact, wants to do, right? Um, uh, she is a shield maiden. This shit's how she wants to be identified, how she is identifying herself. Sam doesn't want to be that. He doesn't want to be a warrior. Doesn't mean he won't fight if it comes to it, right? But he doesn't want to change. He doesn't want to be, he has no aspirations to be anything different. Um, yeah, yeah, no, exactly, exactly. Um, so, yeah, and, and we can see the hobbits as a whole not changing, um, even though... I, you know, uh, Fro Mary and Pippin have changed, right? Well, they've all changed in different ways, um, but not completely, not not sort of exactly like that. Um, yeah, warrior's a profession, mad violinist, I agree. Um, yes, yes, um, yes, they're defending their land, not taking on, taking up the profession. Completely agree. Um, yeah, good. Okay. Next slide. <laughs> Sorry. I have to admit I'm kind of baiting all the people who are chanting for Glorfindel now because you know this is the last completely Glorfindel-free slide that we're going to have. The question is, will we get past this slide tonight? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know if we will. Okay. <clears throat> In the afternoon, they went on down the woods. They were probably following the very track that Gandalf, Bilbo, and the dwarves had used many years before. After a few miles, they came out on the top of a high bank above the road. At this point, the road had left the Horwell far behind in its narrow valley, and now clung close to the feet of the hills, rolling and winding eastward among woods and heather-covered slopes towards the ford in the mountains. 
Not far down the bank, Strider pointed out a stone in the grass. On it, roughly cut, now much weathered, could still be seen dwarf runes and secret marks. There, said Mary, that must be the stone that marked the place where the troll's gold was hidden. How much is left of Bilbo's share, I wonder, Frodo? Frodo looked at the stone and wished that Bilbo had brought home no treasure more perilous nor less easy to part with. None at all, he said. Bilbo gave it all away. He told me he did not feel it was really his, as it came from robbers. Um, okay. They have gone away from the road, right? They crossed it that one time after they, uh, after you know, and the, you know they 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 crossed the bridge, and then they immediately left it after crossing the bridge. Took that uh, long cut up to the north, which did in fact go wrong, despite Aragorn's protestations, and they had to turn around uh, and uh, uh, and uh, uh, you know come back to try to find the road uh, in something like increasing well urgency. I won't say desperation, but urgency. Um, so we get a description of the road and what the road's been doing, right? Um, The road left the Horwell far behind and clung close to the feet of the hills. Notice again all of these active verbs. Um, we've seen this before in the landscape descriptions here, uh, uh, how Tolkien often likes to do this, um, to make the features of the landscape that he's describing into actors, right? Um, look at all the things the road is up to here. Um, it leaves the Horwell. It clings to the feet of the hills. It rolls and winds among the hills and heather-covered slopes. Um, uh, it's uh, this is a very this is a very active road, right? Um, yeah, yeah. Um, and then they find the dwarf runes and secret marks. Now this means. They're close to the road. They've been coming down close to the road this whole time. Um, uh, so they, the last thing they find on their way back down towards the road uh, is the stone where they buried the treasure. You remember Bilbo and Frodo stopping off at this point and collecting the treasure um, uh, on their way home, right? So the dwarves have claimed it and, by the way, cursed it, certainly cursed it placed a curse upon it. Uh, presumably Gandalf and Bilbo are exempted because they were part of the original party uh, who stashed this treasure in the first place. Um, but the runes that the dwarves place upon the treasure here, I, I think it is, in, in The Hobbit, I think it is super clear that the dwarves have placed a curse upon this treasure should anybody else find it and disturb it um, before they get back to it. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I see Erukab and, uh, uh, you know, bunches of people, right? JJ and Elway are all making jokes about the road going ever on and on, right? Um, and how active the road is here. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Um, okay. So we get the old cursed stone of the dwarf's gold here, which ends up just kind of looking adorable by the end, even by the end of The Hobbit, right? When Bilbo and Gandalf come home, Bilbo's almost certainly got more treasure in the chests that he's got strapped to his pony already, right? Um, that he's bringing home from the Lonely Mountain. He's almost certainly got more treasure in there than is in like the entirety that is under the uh, this this rock, right? The treasure that they found in the troll hole when they looted it uh, after the trolls were turned to stone. Um, but he takes that and brings that home, right? And it's interesting, Bilbo was unwilling to let the troll treasure serve as, you know, part of the nest egg of his treasure, right? That was the purpose of it. Why do they do this? Why did the dwarves bother with this? Well, because it's treasure, right? Waste not, want not. But there's almost this sense, it's almost like this uh, 
it's like it's like an investment, right? I mean, they don't know for sure what's going to happen with the the treasure at the end of the road. Whether you know they're on a treasure hunt, right? And so maybe they're going to uh, achieve their ultimate quest and get back to the lonely mountain and recover the treasure of Thorin's grandfather. But you know, maybe not, right? So at least they'll always have the troll treasure here. They found some treasure anyway, right? And so that's comforting. Um, and uh, the, the, it's it's kind of in retrospect, it's kind of fun, right? It's when Bilbo is on his way home from his journey, it looks so small and mundane, right? Um, and, uh, and and of course now, in context, from the point of the new point of view that we have uh, with Frodo here, it looks even more so, right? Even more different than that. Um, so. Uh, you know, we think of how I mean, we, and we've seen this contrast. This contrast has been borne home to us on many occasions here. The significance of Bilbo's first adventure, right, and how much kind of less of a big deal it was than most of the many of the things that Frodo's already been through, and how comparatively frivolous the whole thing was. Right, they were on a treasure hunt. Um, you know what Frodo's doing is in a completely different genre. And you'll notice that here for the first time, that's that contrast is made explicit, right? What was B Bilbo's adventure about? It was a treasure hunt, right? Um, remember Frodo himself made this contrast in Bag End with Gandalf in chapter two, right? Gandalf, or, you know, he says to Gandalf, Bilbo went to find a treasure. I go to lose one. Frodo established that parallel between the ring and the gold, right? That was the goal of Bilbo's journey, right? And Frodo himself is again reflecting on that same contrast here, right? Bil Frodo looked at the stone and wished that Bilbo had brought home no treasures more perilous nor less easy to part with. Um, the contrast, right? Um, but notice the there's a new implication. There's a new overtone here, right? Which we hadn't seen before. Frodo initially, when he didn't know any better, right? When he had just heard Gandalf talk about it and he knew nothing more, um, was primarily struck by the kind of anti-parallel of their missions, right? Bilbo went to f seek a treasure. Frodo's going to lose one, right? Right. Bilbo went there and back again. Frodo's going somewhere, right, into exile, but he doesn't think he's going to come back again. Um, so that, you know, anti-parallel, as I say, of their two journeys, you know, similar in some ways, Bilbo or uh, Frodo feeling that impulse to run down the path uh, without his pocket handkerchiefs, right, just like uh, Bilbo did. We can see there's some parallel impulses there, but ultimately he sees from the beginning that their quests are completely different. But notice here that there's a very different focus, right? Um, he wished that Bilbo had brought home no treasure more perilous nor less easy to part with. Now it's the contrast between the treasure itself, not just the contrast of their journeys, but the treasure itself um, that... Bilbo brought home gold, but of course he also brings home the ring. So again, we have those two things, the dragon gold uh, and Bilbo's treasure being put in, or, or Bilbo's ring rather, being put in parallel with each other, right? But Frodo is contrasting them. The gold is easy. Dragon gold, please, right? Um, it is, dragon gold is, Dragon gold is easy, right? Way less perilous than the Ring of Power. Much easier to part with than the Ring of Power, right? You might come home with gold and treasure, but you can give that away, right? You might be tempted, and remember, this is dragon gold, right? Dragon gold, you might be tempted to hoard that. There are precedents for that, right? And yet, even dragon gold, upon which a dragon has long brooded, is still going to be easier to part with than the Ring of Power, right? So Frodo's very sensitive to that. But notice there's 
again, the, I, I keep bringing up the dragon gold and the dragon sickness because that was the goal of Bilbo's journey, right? That's the contrast that Frodo makes back in Bag End, going to gain a treasure, whereas Frodo goes to lose one. But here, the introduction of the troll gold specifically introduces a different factor, right? Bilbo did ditch the troll gold. He didn't want any part. The troll gold was dirty, dirtier than the dragon gold. The dragon gold, you know, there are issues with the dragon gold. It can bring on the dragon sickness, and that's not a good thing. But it itself was not dirty, right? Bilbo didn't mind uh, building, you know, his wealth for the rest of his life on the dragon gold. Why not? It was a gift to him, right? A gift to him from the king of the dwarves who rightfully owned what treasure he retained, right? Um, and agreed, Eric, have we get the we get the the dwarf cursed gold issue with the troll the the troll gold has different freight to it altogether, right? But again, I I do assume that Bilbo is exempt from the curse and uh, whatever curse the, the dwarves placed on it, um, but. Um, so I, I don't think that that's really an issue, really. But um, Bilbo was willing to build his wealth on dragon gold because ultimately it was gold that was stolen by a dragon, right? And it did have rightful owners. And the heirs of those rightful owners um, gave it to him, right? So that's fine. But loot that you got from the trolls, right? The trolls looted this stuff from other... They plundered other plunderers, to quote Gandalf, right? Uh, or Elrond. Shoot. Elrond, I think. Yes, doubtless they plundered other plunderers. Um, uh, the the trolls had plundered other plunderers and then are plundered in turn by the dwarves and by Bilbo, right? Um, so Bilbo is in taking this gold home, right? He is participating in this long and ignominious string of plundering, right? In the end, he's no, really no different, no better than the trolls. He's recovered it, but what's he going to do with it, right? Um, he's not going to give it back. He's just taken it for himself like the trolls before him did. So, um, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, exactly. Mike says the troll gold would have been fine if it had been returned to its owners, which is impossible because they were probably et up and then given back as a reward. Yeah, sure. Exactly. Which is why, Mike, in some sense, I think like Glamdring and Orchrist have a different sense to them. Right. Um, they, too, are looted from the troll horde. Right. And yet there's a sense of them being returned Especially with Elrond, right? Especially in the in the Lord of the Ring from the Lord of the Rings point of view, when Elrond, the master of Rivendell, has become Elrond, uh, you know, the Elrond from the Silmarillion tradition. Um, you know, he is um, Elrond, right? Is looking at um, Glamdring and saying, "Hey, um, it's Great Grandpa's sword, right?" Here, yeah, you can have it, right? Again, it's different, right? Um, but um, yeah, exactly, Elway. They get they get they get uh, returned to one of the last descendants of Gondolin, who then distributes them, right? Or or you know blesses the uh, the uh, the the you know the keeping of them, right? Um, but the point that I want to come back to, right? The point that I want to uh, uh, keep emphasizing, because what the text emphasizes here is the parallel between the ring and the troll gold, right? So we're already looking at the interesting contrast between dragon gold, normally associated with being hard to get rid of, uh, 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 you know, having putting its hooks in you, right? Um, so that you latch onto it and you become obsessed and and it kind of takes over your mind, right? Like we saw happen with poor Thorin uh, and with less poor um, uh, Master of Lake Town, right? Um, but the ring, of course, he's contrasting the ring with that. It's far worse. But the, get, we, but the troll gold, specifically, right? This loot, this plunder. 
how to get the ring right um the ring is also kind of plundered from other plunderers now bilbo didn't take it from gollum in the same way that gollum you know uh, uh, the, the same way that gollum go well, actually he did get it in the same way that gollum well no that deagle got it right but uh, uh he you know bilbo didn't kill anybody for it right um he doesn't take it off anybody's corpse um and yet there is this sense of dirtiness to it, right? That this parallel establishes. I find that this parallel between the troll gold and the ring invites me to think about the ring in a different way than I've ever really thought about it before. Um, if you see what I mean by that. Bilbo gave it all away. He told me he did not feel it was really his as it came from robbers, right? It's the troll gold specifically that Frodo is thinking about when he says, when he thinks to himself that he wished Bilbo had brought home no treasure more perilous nor less easy to part with, right? Um, Bilbo, finding himself in possession of the troll's loot gets rid of it right gives it away tries to do something good with it right um by giving it away freely but he keeps none of it for himself because it's dirty right if he keeps it if he profits by it then it will make it will soil him like ethically right morally it will soil him he can't he doesn't want to claim that gold for his own. He's just going to give it away, right? Because it's the best he can do with this blood money, right? With this, uh, the with the plunder of plunderers. Tony, exactly. And yet he claimed the ring, right? Um, and Frodo seems conscious of that. I... What I'm kind of gently trying to get around to here is that the parallel that Frodo suggests between the troll gold, which Bilbo does do the right thing by and give away, and by the ring, which he doesn't give away, at least not for a long time, right, is a, is a little unflattering to Bilbo, right? Ironically, Bilbo... Can, now, he did it in ignorance, Right? But, uh, um, but nevertheless, he, he made the right call with the troll's gold. If only he had gotten rid of the ring too. If only he hadn't claimed the ring. If only he had passed it on to somebody, almost anybody earlier on, right? Then now, then it wouldn't be. Frodo's problem. Now, likely a bot, you're absolutely right. Can't even talk about this with Bilbo without recalling that, of course, Bilbo does eventually give it away, and it's really a big deal that he does so, right? So it seems a little hard to be harsh on Bilbo for not giving up the ring, when in fact, he does give up the ring, eventually. Um, yes. But even there, it's not the same, right? He gives up the troll gold because he wants to distance himself from it. Because he acknowledges that it's bad, right? That it's corrupting. Um, and he doesn't want anything to do with it. Um, with uh, the ring, he does give it up. But not for that reason, right? He makes a sacrifice. He surrenders it to Frodo. Because... Gandalf tells him that it's the right thing to do, right? But he doesn't distance himself from it, right? He's not, at no point does he, I mean, even later on, right? He's still talking about the ring like it's perfectly fine, right? Um, uh, yeah, yeah. Um, and for Thoughtless, I agree that, of course, had Bilbo given it away or thrown it away or whatever, you know, just disposed of it like he disposed of the troll gold, you know, that would have had terrible consequences likely. Yeah, sure, it just would have passed it on to somebody else. But I do think 
that's what one of the other dimensions of Frodo's thinking here is that ultimately Frodo is, is guilty of sort of a selfish fantasy here. The wish that he's wishing is ultimately, again, it's selfish, right? Um, if only Bilbo hadn't brought it home, right? If only it had never come to me. If only this had not been even an issue. If only it were somebody else's problem right now, right? Um, yeah. Is that selfish? Yeah, sure, it is, right? Totally natural, of course. Hardly going to think less of Frodo for that. Um, but um, uh, but we're going to see Frodo articulate something like this much more explicitly much later on, right? So I think that we're not on the wrong track to imagine, uh, you know, to take the hint from this parallel that um, Frodo is indulging in that uh, line of thinking, right? Um, yeah. Well, I think we should stop there for tonight. This seems like a good stopping place. Um, yeah, yeah, <laughs> I, think, I think this is a great stopping place. Uh, <laughs> sorry, sorry. No, but it really, it's really time. Uh, it's really time for us to go. Um, but it could be worse. I could be doing this to you before we have like our two week hiatus, right? Uh, for the holidays. So, uh, you know, at least, at least we'll get there. We'll get there this year. Right. So, uh, because next week is, uh, still, so what is next week? Is the left? This was what the 18th. Yeah. Oh yeah. We're good. So we'll have class next week. Uh, and, um, we will have, We'll have a whole week with Glorfindel next week. I promise. I promise. Um, okay. That's it. That's it. No problem. So, uh, we're, I'm going to, uh, I'm going to, uh, well, I'm going to let the folks on Twitter go. Thanks, uh, Twitter folks, uh, for joining me again. Feel free to join us on Twitch, twitch.tv slash Signum U. Uh, and, uh, we're going to, we're, it's a uh, field trip time. All right. So I'm going to say goodbye here. If I can find that X, there we go. All right. <laughs> Good. Okay. Good evening, everyone. I'm on as Jonathan tonight. Okay. So next week we get jingle bells, jingle bells. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Okay. Um, so, uh, we're going to head back to the troll shows and continue All exploring right. here. All right. So I think probably just the same thing, right? Yeah. Yeah. Same thing. Uh, Thorin had is of course, one of those places that you can get uh, a horse to, but not swift travel, but not swift travel. So, and nuts to that. No real advantage to it. <laughs> All right. All right. See, I did make up the first couple of Gorfindel slides. All right, I'll try to go this uh -huh. way. I know it's it's kind of faster to go this way, but I usually end up lagging so much that. Now, is it actually faster it's, to jump off the bridge? I think it's six of one half dozen another. I actually mm. just ride down the high stair. I go past the... Yeah. I go past. Yeah. Um, well, anyway. Um, mm -hmm. I did prepare two Corfindle slides tonight, but I knew it was... Uh, I knew when I made them that it was exceptionally unlikely that we would get that far tonight. It was an act I'm a of sheer optimism to have made the slides in the first place. Um, yeah, but it's it's yeah, but it's one less thing, you know. Yeah, exactly. Always use them next week, especially this time of year. It's always good to have one less thing to do. <laughs> exactly. 
Exactly. Especially for me this year. Mm-hmm. As I am in the midst of... Oh, right. I was like looking at the troll shaws and just finding Rivendell. Um, yeah, I know. <laughs> uh, yeah, this year. Gotta my... go to lands. Yeah, it's all the bottom now since they got all the extra stable things now. Yes, so true. Um, yeah, anyway. Um, it's... Uh, yeah, it's possibly the one of the busiest Decembers of my life, so it's a crazy season. All right. Okay. All right. All right. Your kids always want you to do a bunch of Christmas activities on top of everything, too. Like, we have to do this, and we have to make paper snowflakes, and we have to have hot chocolate, and we have to watch a Christmas story. And... Yes, like, yes. Yeah. Uh, uh, it's, uh, you know, it's, it is one of those things where, like, you know, you you don't even realize sometimes. I mean, so, sometimes, of course, you, as a parent, deliberately initiate traditions, which you you know, insist on being traditions and, and, you know, kids usually mm-hmm. pick that stuff up relatively well. And, oh uh, yeah. But, uh, it's funny. You don't realize that, it. <laughs> yeah. The, the things that become tradition that you totally never intended, you know, like yes, the restaurant that we now go to like every Christmas Eve, cause we went there once and you know, the next year they were like, we should go back to that restaurant again. And now like we have to, it's now like, absolutely. Yeah. That's the same thing. Mandatory. If there's a Christmas parade, we have to go to Molly's Irish pub. They have to get those fried mac and cheese triangles. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like, it's now a holiday tradition. Like, you can't avoid yeah. it. See, that's when paper chains come in handy. It's like, here, add three more feet before you ask me to do anything else. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So now I it's, don't tear paper. <laughs> it's good. My, uh, 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 my kids, you know, favorite holiday traditions are relatively, I shouldn't complain. I mean, they're relatively uh, time. Mm-hmm. Um, I... Th- they're not too burdensome. They're not too burdensome. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's fine. Yeah, it's always fun to just take a break from the routine, too, and just stop and go, oh, right. <laughs> but, like, I'm looking at my Christmas tree I'm right now. I'm like, oh, when did we put that up? You know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's a sign December's going too fast. Yes. Yes. We did finally get our tree up. We got our tree up late this year. We did our Christmas tree this past weekend. Uh mm-hmm. But uh, we did, we did get that done. And yes, Tony, you are correct. That is one of the things that is making my December a very busy December is dealing with state legislatures. I'm I'm spending that is right far yeah. more time in the month of December talking to members of the New Hampshire State Senate than I normally do in December. It's um, not all jolly and mistletoe and holly and exactly. other things ending in Molly. Yeah. No, not at all. Should I just plow on ahead of everybody? There we go. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So we're gonna we're gonna keep, gonna keep plowing because we're gonna go back up to Thornhod, right? Now, one thing that I've I've never found, and I don't think it's here. Maybe it's in the game, and I've just never found it. I can't rule that out, uh-huh. but I don't think it is, and that is the stone that marked the troll's gold. I, I tried to find that. Um, uh, I don't think there I've was. We got pots it. and pans and we got the door. Yes. Yes. We, we see the troll hole. Uh, and, uh, and of course we saw the trolls glade. Um, but, uh, all right. Here are those bushes that, um, not the unless they, uh, okay. buried it quite far away from the site, you know? Yeah. Yeah. So I don't really know. Um, Depends on how paranoid they were. <laughs> right. Right, exactly. I mean, the. You know, this. Oh, where are we? I should follow you. Yeah. This stone, that's the, the white stone that you're supposed to. Right. Mm-hmm. Yes, bang it right at the stone and you'll get to the, the camp there. Um, mm-hmm. The fact that there is a significant stone next to the path as a marker of a, of a location. Seemed always seemed to me like an indirect nod at the stone from the troll's treasure. Um, 
but actually it always kind of made me a little bit more disappointed that I couldn't find the stone. It's just trail marking. I mean, I learned that in Girl Scouts. There's right. different things mean different things. Right. See, so now how close were we to the trolls? Eh, getting there. Hey, look, I have this. That's the troll glade there, right? Yes, it is. I've got that marked on my map here on Gladden. Yeah. Um, okay, so we're getting close, but not quite yet to where they yeah, yeah. came back to the road. That's one of the things I want to look at as we go through here. Um, mm -hmm. Of course, as we've talked about many times before, they can't just directly render, you know, the landscape descriptions into the game because the scale is totally mm -hmm. different and it just doesn't work out. Um, they do, I think, do a pretty good job of capturing sort of a lot of the spirit of the landscape that Tolkien describes. Um, oh, yeah. We've looked at that at, uh, in several places. Um, but... Uh, I love that it always matches the time of year that the company went through, too. Yes, that is always fun. So here, though, as we enter yes, the Bruin so and Gorges... Yeah. Um, so right now we're just past. So I guess actually, if we just, yeah, S where they would have come out to the road would have been somewhere like around here, right? Because the mm -hmm. Trolls Glade is just to the north of here. Yes, it is. Mm -hmm. Um. Yeah. So. And you'll remember the description of the road when they come about how you coming down the steep bank, right? Oh, so we're being attacked by wolves, right? How they, yeah. they, they, we, we didn't quite get to that passage today, but how they, oh, yeah. they, they come down a steep bank. The, the road is running between steep banks at this point. Yes. So we yes. get these gorges and banks here that you can, in fact, tumble down. Um, <laughs> Uh, if you're so, a high elf, you can somersault down. Really? You can somersault down? Yeah, remember in the Oh, intro? right, yes, that's right. I, I, you give a little tuck and roll, like an action Yeah, it's still the only man. time I've ever actually played my high elf, so I'm still not used to the <laughs> actual... Yeah, we got to roll another one and have some fun with it. Yeah, yeah. Um. Anyway, okay, so we're now past where they would have they would have met Gorfindel somewhere back in there. Uh, presumably. Mm -hmm. um, and we'll come through here next time as well. Another trail marker? Another trail marker. Which I always expect. I always, I always still, like any of these rocks next to the road, I've spent so long, uh -huh. like, searching for runes on these rocks. Now, are the bears here supposed to be a pun on Bruin? Because that's what. It... Uh, I never thought of that, but that seems possible. <laughs> the first thing that always comes to my mind is like, oh, this is where the dang bears are. <laughs> right, right. Um, yeah, oh, hey, uh, Johannes, that's a great question. Um, actually, hang on a second. Let me. So we're going we're gonna to not go up to uh, Thorinhut itself because we went there last uh -huh. week. So we're just going to yep, yep. carry on up this way. I just want to make sure I'm pointed in the right direction before I start. Okay. Answering questions or talking about things. So Johannes is reminding me, and, and Johannes, thanks for bringing that up because I didn't, um, I, you know, I can't talk about all of the questions and comments um, at the beginning of class, or else we'll never get to any passages long enough today. Um, but uh, uh, Zephin's post about noble titles, uh, it was interested in the fact that the the ring the the lore poem of the Rings of Power uh, includes references to the Elven kings and the dwarf uh, and the and the dwarf lords, right? Uh huh. But then, when Gandalf is talking about them in prose later, oh, I'm getting an attack here. He reverses it. Uh, yes. And he calls them elf lords and dwarf kings. And so Zephin's question was, are these words just? Uh, um, you know, interchangeable, basically, or, you know, what exactly is, uh, what exactly is happening there? And Good question. I, 
I'm really not sure what the answer is. I mean, Gandalf's reversing of, so basically one way to think about this question is, was, uh, was Gandalf just using them interchangeably here? Oh, I've come to a cliff that mm -hmm. I didn't expect. Um, is he, I, was he using, I think I'm going to dismount here. I know that people are getting attacked anyway, so we might as well go yeah, yeah. from here. Um, oh yeah, we got these guys coming up. Yeah. So, um, anyway, um, is Gandalf basically, so basically the question is, is Gandalf demonstrating that these two words are essentially synonyms or is he correcting like in some sense, the poem like, ah, actually, you know, the old rhyme of lore gets it wrong. You shouldn't say elf king and dwarf lord. You should say elf lord and dwarf king. Um, hmm. uh, and honestly, I think if I had to go with an answer, I would go with synonyms, really. Um, hmm. I, I don't know that they're, I wouldn't, I don't know that I would say they're exactly synonyms in yeah, oh. every sense. Oh, we got uh, Lots control of. action here. Hey, are these trolls dressed differently? I don't know. This one looks like he's wearing diapers. Oh, he's got a sun on that big. All right, let's not kill every you know people who are gonna yeah. aggro them. Just yeah, hang on. Let, let me run just ahead for so a we get a good here. look. Yeah. yeah. Look at the fleshy dude here. The green ones are pretty standard. I haven't seen the yeah, but this fleshy guy. dude one. He's got uh, yeah, okay. he's. Let him hit you. Who's <laughs> really got a shield with a star on it? Oh Let's yeah. See. Looks Those like he's look just like... tight. Hide somebody else's armor. Yes, onto I think those are secondhand shields. Yeah, that's a Numenorean sh uh, star on his shield. Yeah, it is. Yeah. I wonder how. Yeah. Come on, fleshy dude. All right. Yeah, yeah, it's a Numenorean star on his shoulder. He's got liver spots. Yeah, and he looks like he's wearing a kilt. A uh, grass skirt. Uh, Bloomers? That's a grass skirt. That's yeah, a grass skirt. Maybe it's a grass totally. skirt. Okay, another little Rudarin and... ruin. And again, look at this. Where is this Rudarin ruin? Beauty spot, right? Yep. Scenic overlook from this direction. Oh, yeah. Right? Look at this view, right? Oh, this beautiful valley and the woods on the other side. And the weather is the, here. The Wish you were beautiful. Right? Oh, oh man, this is good. Those are nice falls. Yeah, it's a beautiful these, Does this lead to the... No, does it lead to the Fort of Vernon? Uh, presumably no, I guess not. it goes down, but no? No, it's it's separate. It goes in the other direction? Yeah, yeah see, it seems beautiful. to disappear. I think it goes underground. Beautiful fawn. We've got right. what there's a gazebo down over this way, right? Didn't I uh -huh. see? Where did it go? It's over down over Reminds here. Reminds me of when I worked in the Canada Pavilion of Epcot. There it is, <laughs> over here. Yeah. Oh yeah, but another pretty spot. So you can <clears throat> have like what you like choose your like picnicking location, right? Whether it's over there, uh -huh. or then you've got this little gazebo here, a little statue on top gazebo with the artichokes and the. Oh yeah, see this is lovely. I guess the spots on them means that. Oh no, this is paint. There's a handprint on there. Ah, it's paint. Yeah. I was like, maybe he's going to turn into some kind of Jasper when he turns into a stone. I don't know, but <laughs> sure, like I think it's paint. It's paint. Okay. That's interesting. Mm. Huh. Huh. Um, it does see seem like most of the, our three statue friends down there are more metropolitan than these guys, but. Yeah, maybe so. Maybe so. Maybe they're the trolls who got out a little. Yeah, so again, I think up here we're definitely seeing what looks like Rudaurin, um Palaces. Yeah, exactly. Kind of like, like, you know, Enuminous. Yeah. Huh? I th I, I'm going to say this is, you know, because of how north it is, this is probably a summer location. Oh, Let's yeah, that, that paint is really clear on him when you see him from the... Yeah. Fully from the front. Yeah, what looked like liver spots before. Uh-huh. Yeah, oh, and there's the green guy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
Yeah, hands and various other things. I don't think I ever came up here. Me neither. Yet but you notice there's no water down there. There's there's absolutely no water down there. The waterfall. Where does the water? I think the water all goes underground. Huh. Yeah. Looks like it does. And Weird. we're too far. Uh, we're too far um, west to be part of the Fort of Brunin. So. Yeah. Where is it all going? Oh, I think there's an instance up there. It's just full of trolls down there. Yeah, yeah. I think that's the necropolis on the far side. Yes, I think so. I think it is. Yes. I think that part up there was part of an instance that I'd done at some point. I don't remember who with or Right up why. above the waterfalls? Oh, it was a girls of Mythgard. That's what. It was a girls of Mythgard we did up there. Yeah. Yeah. Something about it looks really familiar. Yeah. That's the lost te temple, Deathman says? Uh, yes. Okay. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Had a very Indiana Jones vibe about it. Yeah. Okay. Right. Yep. All right. We got there, but yeah, I don't ever remember being up on this hill before. Me neither. Look, and there are more ruins over there. Those of us see this was a tower, clearly over here. Uh huh. Hang on. Yeah. I gotta find my way up here. I'm running into the wall. Watchtower, but what are they watching? Oh yeah, it's not climbable on either side. Nah. But yeah, it does look like a tower with an even nicer view than the uh -huh. gazebo down there that we were looking at. See a little water, but that's yeah, just that just pond we saw. Yeah, exactly. It's a it's that pond that we crossed. So it's got to be under. It's got to be an underground source. Though that whole, it looks like a water channel down there. It looks like it once was. Yes. Yeah. So, obviously, a sinkhole opened up. Right. Beneath the waterfall. Yeah. Yeah. Ooh, I wonder if it feeds something into uh, Moria, in theory. Who knows? We're a little far from there, but... You know, apparently the water runs all the way down, uh, if, uh, uh, you know, bingo is any evidence. Mm-hmm. Um, oh, yeah. <laughs> so, this watchtower. So, the direction we are facing now is south, right? South, southwest, but right yeah. straight towards the road, basically. So, this valley, this watchtower would have watched this valley. And the um, river, possibly. And the river, right. Because people could. Th in, remember the towers all along the, uh, the Brandywine? Right, mm -hmm. uh, the Numenor the Arnorian towers there. Uh, so maybe if maybe this was a river in Rudauran times, right? Mm -hmm. um, you know, back when that was an acting an active gazebo, right? Back when this was in the uh, you know the the Rudauran travel guide as like top places to come for lunch. Uh, <laughs> this was a river. <laughs> Uh, that connected down with the road. And so they built a tower up here in order to watch the approach, even if the river was gone by then. Still, this would have been an easy... I mean, it's the way we came up here, right? Presumably it's mm -hmm. the... Uh, well, it's, actually, it's our the river would explain the... The river would explain how, why, how spread out all the runes are with seemingly no like connection to the two. If, right. if you look at your map, all the places we've looked at are connected by this big trough that goes through to the roads. Yes, yes. So that would explain if there was a river or some, some water passage on there, that would have connected all of them. Right, so they could have used the river mm -hmm. to navigate, presumably. Then yeah. to get across to the other palaces, this side for the gastro pub, the other side for the vinegar tasting. Right, right. Now, Katriana, there are no remnants of any bridges along the road, but remember, there are those gorges mm -hmm. that the road passes through. So that does suggest that the road itself postdates any water flowing through there, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, yeah. 
Yeah, well, probably. It does kind of imply that the water was gentle and passable, too. Right. Right. Um, yeah, possibly. Possibly. Um, yeah, it's hard to say, Deathman, whether this might be Ford's... Uh, you know, whether this might have been Rivers back in the first age, or whether it... Um, uh, you know, whether the, whether the drying up of this river is more recent. Hard to say. Huh. But I like that, uh, you know, we can do not only archaeology, not only amateur uh, fake archaeology uh, in the Lotro ruins, but also fake geology and stuff. I don't know any other kind of archaeology or geology. <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm kidding. I was actually really good at geology in school. But that's I was just fun. bad at math. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's sort of fun to put together. Um, okay, let's yeah, I'd hate uh, for a profession to examine all of my analyses of landscapes over the past two years. <laughs> right. Right. Okay, does this descend down to the camp on this side? Huh. I really feel like I must have at some point come up here, but I really don't think I ever did. See, this is where I kept getting thinking we were on the other side where... The, um, where the where the white spiders were, yeah. no, no, oh. the, yeah, no, yeah. I kept thinking when we were on the other side of of this uh, range. Sorry, I kept I, getting confused because they look so similar. Yeah, they really do. Sorry, I wanted to come down to no the Glamgill Falls. I don't even recognize Glam that Gil? name. Glamgill. Glamgill. What would that mean? Glamgill. The like. Who are we fighting? Oh, there's a troll down there. I'm like, okay, the, the troll's in the bushes to me. Um, so well, a glum was foe, well, right? Gl oh, glum is, uh, uh, yeah, star noise, El I was thinking in the same direction. So glum means like, uh, like noisy, rowdy, like the glum hoth, uh, you know, is the, the enemies. Um, so this might be the, the, the noisy falls. Yeah, Glom, I think, okay. has to refer to the noise of these falls, which certainly, although I can't hear them currently, seem like they would be <laughs> fairly noisy, right? Um, Still, that's a rather unpoetic name for something this majestic. Right, Glom, Gil, though. It makes a lot of noise. But why Let's star? Call it like noisy the, the association call. between the noise and the star is the thing that I find interesting. But huh. Okay. All right, and that's where the water all just vanishes. Yeah, it doesn't seem to go anywhere. Huh. I've been to that side. That's that was like the troll spa back there. I remember that. I've run into that a couple of times by accident. Right. Okay. Oh, and here we see places where the. Uh, oh, and we're getting oh, our first we. whites here. Yay, white slayer! Um, That's so metal. Okay, so here we're getting places. This isn't a dead end, is it? Uh, this, that part is. I think we can keep going up that slope. Oh, yeah, yes, I think yeah. we can. That's right. I, I, so I'm interested in the places here where these... I'm trying to figure out where these ruins f just fell. Did they like, subside? Did the cliff subside under them and they slid down? Yeah, there's ruins up on the top of the cliff up there. Yeah. Or did the trolls knock them off? I suppose that's possible. Or maybe the erosion of the missing river. The ground dried up and the sides caved out. Yeah. There we have or a bridge. Or just fell down and sank into the river. Yeah. But the fourth one. <laughs> you told that joke how many times on these? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's always funny! <laughs> Okay, right. This is the path that leads up to the... Yeah, all right. Okay, now I know all exactly right. where we are. All right. Where, 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 we, where I thought we were, what, two, three weeks ago or something. <laughs> right, exactly. 
Yes, where I thought we were, too. Okay. And we find out there's two of these places. Yeah, here, let's, let's head up here now. Yeah, there we see. Yeah, look at the, the uh, how those walls are just oh, teetering that, on the edge up there. Yeah, yeah. that one's going to go. Yeah, those. <clears throat> so I think clearly those ruins at the bottom of the hill are the victims of erosion, right? Yep. That makes sense. Some troll's going to get a very big, heavy, and interesting hat. Yeah. And he walks underneath there. Oh, a human. Another Korkur. Korkur. Those are the hillmen, right? Yep. Ones with the interesting new banners they yes. got from us. See if we see any of their banners, too. Although, uh, something for lore masters over here. Or scholars, sorry. Right. You rat. Who's this guy? He's just a skirmisher. And we've got some... Yeah. Just some well, braziers here. Braziers for light? Or heat, it looks like, even. Yeah, they're up pretty high. I'd stand next to that. Yeah, it's getting a little nippy. <laughs> oh, man, don't even talk. I was stuck in a freezing cold car for two and a half hours this morning trying to get. <laughs> Virginia is the only place where 20 miles could mean... 10 minutes, it could mean an hour. Right. could mean two hours. <laughs> yeah, now this is clearly a defensive work here, which is interesting. Up here ah. on this. It is, those are serious walls. Right? Yeah. Those were walls that meant business. And then we come down yeah. to this. This is not a leisure palace. No. No, no, like Let's the other see here. we were seeing. Here's how we got across the river here. We got a bridge. Yeah. Now, More of course, course this river. would work and be relevant whether or not there was water down there, right? Yeah, but I tend to think there is. I mean, look at the shape of everything. Well, it's clear that there was. The question is just how long ago? How long ago uh -huh. was this a river valley? Was it, a, um, is, you know, earlier in the Third Age? Or are we talking... You know, first age. Yeah, I couldn't say. But yeah, this is obviously a pretty major settlement here. Yeah. Very, Two kinds of stone too. You see very that? Interior. Yes, I did. Yes, and it's and it's the lost temple up on the hilltop. That's the different. La, different la, from the rest la. Of them. Yeah. Yeah more defensive works over here so again yeah. there's that sense of uh so thick, that thick walls. no no gazebos huh <laughs> yeah because and because the, there's no way up here right the, you know this this city here mm -hmm. the only way to access so the whole that whole first fortification that we went up through that's like that uh -huh. whole place is like the gatehouse to this city. yeah it would have made more sense to make that a drawbridge you wonder if they had more that were our actual more temporary drawbridges well, but I mean, like, seriously, they're not going to get besieged that often up here, but yet it's still pretty intense. I mean, this city is inaccessible by any way except for this bridge, which then leads onto that defended plateau, which then you have to wind down the narrow, windy path to get up it in the first place, right? And then once you get over here, even, you've still got, you know, these walls and everything. That feeds our paranoid. There. Oh, look, trees just hovering in the air here. <laughs> oh, oh, look at that. Hovery trees. Oh. We're we're in, we're not in Kansas anymore. Yeah. I don't even yeah. want to talk about that. No, no, no. Rudar. Man, it's all Rudar. Yeah. What is this? But yeah, it sort of feeds into his paranoia. He's such an in such a remote place with so many sort of th this is a plotting castle. This is a plotting right. evil castle. Right. But he can rub his hands and laugh maniacally. What is this? A tomb? An altar? It's pretty questionable. Yeah. Let's see. Rudar stamp all over the place here. Yeah. 
Yeah, definitely. And then, let's see, is it through uh, here? We're actually going to go... stars under the dirt here. Yeah. Actually going to go underground here, right? Yeah. Oh. As I recall, yeah. yes. Yes, and that's it an instance an in instance. there. Yes. Yeah, it's an instance. Pretty sure it is. Yeah, yeah just so here's this, yeah, this interior fortress, which then leads to a, a completely underground thing. So yeah, again, levels within levels here. Um, mm -hmm. This was a, a, a very remote and, and very secretive Rudaran city here. Yep. Yeah, you wonder if this... Uh... He was starting to craft some places where he could meet with some Angmar people and not be noticed. Yeah, that's an interesting possibility. Especially as we're getting geographically further and further north here, right? I mean, mm -hmm. going out a little bit from here. Uh, we can see where are we. We are up here. There's Weathertop. So, yeah. I mean, it's the Etten Moors and, um, and Angmar to the north. Mm-hmm. Yeah, let's see more. I haven't seen any of the big iron fish hooks or anything. Explicitly any oh, you oh, mean? Oh. Yeah. No. Oh wait, we do have this guy here. Who? Where? Brazier's in the the Brazier's in the, the tomb over here. Wait. Brazier's in the tomb? I didn't see that. Right. You, I think you ran right past it. I think I did. <laughs> Trying to take a shortcut around through the bushes over yeah. here. Yeah. Okay. Take shortcuts, you missed us. Exactly. There we go. We got finally some evidence of some nasty stuff going on here. Yeah, so the braziers... And I see this altar looks like it's newer. Made of different stone. Mm-hmm. Ooh. It hasn't been cleaned up, though. It's got plants all over it. And it has Arnorian stars on the side instead of uh -huh. the Rudaran trees, which the other... One did. I mean, obviously, it's got root iron trees all over the place here, but the yeah, yeah, altar yeah. itself has Not... the star on it. That's interesting. Yeah, this is the ones we saw um, up, you know, the gaunt men. Where was that? Yeah. I think it was in Lonelands. There was an area in Lonelands where there's a couple of these uh, altars and pyres all over the place with gaunt men. Yeah. Right. Right. Okay. And. Which way up to the Lost Temple? It's not at the top of this hill, is it? Yes, it is, I believe. Is it? Okay. Mm -hmm. That's the stone we saw, and that's where the falls are, so... All right. Yeah, Katrana, I think it, it does have the look there, as if, like, that one is Arnorian, and so therefore the oldest part that... Um, it does definitely have that look. If it did come first, then that does explain why the Rudarans wanted to just sort of set everything up around it. Mm -hmm. Another wall with another gateway and another inner city. Osbrandras. I don't know what that means. Okay, and... Mm. Big guys up here. Oh, here are the falls again. Yeah. Nobody kill those big guys up on that altar if you can help it. Oh, yeah. Yeah, up here. Up here? No, 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 over here. Oh, right. Oh, those guys, yes. Yeah, these guys. Looks like a Gauntman and a Skirmisher. Yeah. Gurdring? Minion of Plague, okay. Minion of Plague. Sure. Gelato. Oh, we got that altar again. Ah. Yeah. And... Yep, same altar with the Arnorian Stars. Yep. And I can't jump on it, so it's made of the same stuff. <laughs> Okay, see, and here we're looking at the back side, right? That's the back side of that hill. That's the bridge we came across, yeah. yeah. Exactly, that first hill. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. you can see the, the 
the Arnorian ruins behind us. And that's back over there. Yep. To the left. Uh, we have to go back out. There. We have old, to go out to the. There's the gazebos that we were looking at before. Uh huh. The ones that overlook the falls beautifully. Yeah. Okay. Right. We get to find the temple though. We've got to go back, right? Yeah, we got to go back and go to that fork in the road. So this really looks like the sort of the innermost of the innermost cities, right? The one right next to the top of the falls. Mm -hmm. Oh, this is where we need to go up the slope, right? Instead of... Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Whew. This is one of those really good for your calves slopes. Yes. You imagine doing this in full armor? <laughs> <laughs> Legends of the Hidden Temple. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Here is the oh, there's stand. no door. There's no door because you have to get in with the instance. <laughs> oh, look at the moss everywhere. That's cool. Yeah. That's really so what not... makes the difference. And there are no it... Rudaran symbols. Yeah, it's not quite Yellowstone like we thought. It's just stone that's covered in lichen. Yeah. Is this... um, try different ways to get in, but it looks like it's blocked off because you have to get in with the instance. Trixie, Trixie game. Oh, I'm pretty sure Isn't that's insurmountable. No, I seem to remember no, walking to into this. It, were you in the instance? Uh, whoa. All I remember is coming up here when I was on level mm -hmm. and suddenly finding myself in an area where the mobs were like level 80. Huh. Or something. Well, we can try going exactly. around and see. We can try going around and see, but it doesn't look like it. Yeah, I don't think so. None Toraneth. Yeah. No. Maybe I, maybe I just happened in, into the instance. I don't know. But... <laughs> Or, anyway, or maybe there was a there was a previous quest that had to be filled out before him. Is the other maybe. thing. Maybe given what we can see here, again, the super remarkable thing, no Rudaran symbols at all. Yeah. Now we know why there was all this obsession with occupation out here. Right. So, and I hang on. I need to back up so I can see where we are on the map. Because as long as we are <laughs> in the Lost Temple place, we are in Instance Land instead of on huh. the map. Trying to back up without. Yeah, it's like prepared. nothing is inviting me to go to the instance either. It's like. Sorry, I'm just trying to get back away enough to. There we go. So I'll be back on the map. Okay. Yeah, there we go. Non Torneth, yes. Yes. All right. Um, so just looking at the location of this, mm -hmm. up here in the extreme northeast corner of this section of the troll shots with this section which has seen many Rudaran pleasure spots and Rudaran fortresses the Rudaran fort you know sort of series of fortress cities uh that we're seeing Gate up houses, here in towers this, yeah yeah um being the most intense and in the back of them all is this city where the stone looks different again it is because of the lichen but it but that still seems to suggest this looks like a you know this looks like a more ancient ruin than the rest yeah. of them. Yeah. Um, suggesting what that this is one of the like ancestral homes of the Rudarans that this yeah, was or pre schism. Yeah. yeah, definitely pre schism because it's not marked with the with the Rudaran crown all over the place. It might be some so it might not have been. Or Norian, it might have been Rudaran protecting what he perceived to be his roots. Right. Right. Hence all the fortification to keep people from occupying it. Yeah. Or is it important for like, you know, was it important, you know, all of these elaborate series of walls and bridges and things? Um, I mean, to think of the number of fortifications somebody would have had to fight through to get to this place. Right. Does uh -huh. that suggest that this ancient ruin at the heart was 
you know, very important to them? You know, was the, the you know, the ancient city, uh, was know, it a refuge? Is the other one, if it's that right. heavily guarded a refuge, is it, is it, uh, you know, were they protecting it from desecration? It's described as a lost temple, right? Which is interesting. Was it a religious site? Possibly. Uh, how, how was it lost? Yeah. <laughs> Why was it? Who lost it? How? Right. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, well, I thought this is where the whites are, but all I can see are spiders. <laughs> right. Yeah. Uh, it's uh, yeah. It's very tantalizing, but does seem to be a piece of ancient Rudaran history here, mm-hmm. and something that surely predates them. Well, it's getting late, and I and we've come to the yes, edge of the map and beyond the edge of the map here uh, in this uh, in this place. Um, Literally. Yeah, exactly. So uh, I think we're going to sign off here. Thanks, everybody, for joining us, uh, both on our field trip and for our class discussion today. We'll be back next week for our final class session of 2018, uh, as we'll be missing the next two Tuesdays uh, for the holidays. But mm-hmm. thanks, everybody, for being with me tonight. Thanks, for Lori, for accompanying me on the trip here. My pleasure. And uh, see everybody next week. Bye. Bye. Night, everyone. Thanks for joining me on this epic exploration of The Lord of the Rings and of Standing Stone's video adaptation of Tolkien's story. If you are having even half the fun I'm having on this journey, I hope you will consider supporting the project by donating at signumuniversity.org fund.